Russia's granny ripper. For roughly 15 years, an unassuming Russian woman named Tamara Samsonova may have secretly murdered between 10 and perhaps as many as 14 people. When she was finally arrested in 2015, she was 68 years old, just weeks removed from her final gruesome murder. Her age and the way she dismembered her victims' bodies led to her Granny Ripper nickname. She was also given the nickname of Babushka Yaga due to rumors of cannibalism, her interest in the occult, and the fact that her overall look led many to label her a real-life Baba Yaga. She was finally caught when some of her victims' uh, body parts were found dumped haphazardly near her apartment. Despite having her own apartment nearby, police found her residing in the nearby residence of her last victim. Not a good look. When they walked in, there was blood on the walls. There was a saw she'd used to cut her poor victim up just laying out in the open. An even worse look. And then, as if the police needed any more evidence of her guilt, investigators obtained uh, CCTV footage of her hauling body parts out of the murdered woman's apartment in bags, including what would turn out to be a head in a covered uh, cooking pot. When Samsonova's story broke into the press, the Russian tabloids went buck wild and started without any real proof claiming that Babushka Yaga ate her victims, uh, that she killed in order to complete dark occult rituals. Many Russians, based on the press her story received, believed that Tamara Samsonova was an actual witch as well. Crazy, right? It is crazy. It's all a, a very Russian thing to believe as well. Current belief in the occult is very strong in Russia today. Faith healers, witches, sorcerers, yes, sorcerers, currently very much in demand. More so than actual medical doctors. A highly entertaining, a preposterously, gloriously vodka-soaked Russian episode awaits today on Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday and work can wait. I'm Dan Cummins, the Suck Master, the Master Sucker, and you're listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, praiseable Jangles, hail Lucifina, and glory be to Michael motherfucking McDonald. I know many of you spaces are wondering how I'm doing health-wise. Uh, some of you time suckers who listen to the uh, secret suck. I think I said time suckers. I meant time suckers. Well, I recorded this episode early, not long after last week's secret suck. Uh, still not feeling uh, that great. Still waiting for my COVID results. Should have them soon. Joe and I are the only ones in the office. If you're curious, we're in separate rooms. Doing everything I can to be extra safe and not spread it. Uh, I'm sure by next week's show, uh, before uh, I will have answers about the, uh, about the COVID fucking 2020, uh, good news. I had this granny ripper suck prepped before my body felt like someone took a baseball bat to it. And, uh, before night sweats kept me from sleeping before my skin felt like someone rubbed it with light sandpaper. Uh, I do feel plenty good enough to tell this story today. At the moment I'm hopped up on a day quill fucking, <laughs> uh, Tylenol about 75 vitamins. And uh, I feel good enough to, to tell this story. My voice feels fine. My chest uh, doesn't feel bad. My lungs feel great. My dick is still uh, three to four feet long, depending on my uh, mood and, and the lunar cycle. Uh, hail Nimrod and here we go. Uh, for those of you who didn't make it to the end of last week's Time Sucker updates, excited to say that uh, Bad Magic Productions gave $7,200 to girlsinthenow.org. Uh, this is a great organization. The mission of Girls in the Know is to empower girls to embrace a strong sense of self. Because uh, every seven seconds, a girl is bullied. One out of two or one or two of every hundred students, female students, will struggle with an eating disorder. One in 14 girls has an STI. Seven out of 10 girls believe they're not good enough, don't measure up in some way in America today. And Girls to Know puts on four-week empowerment workshops uh, led by female professionals. And our donation will help a whole bunch of girls be able to take these workshops for free. Uh, it was really inspiring last week to read about how... Uh, how passionate, lovely young meat sack Grace Abafi is about making a difference in the lives of young girls. We need more Graces in the world. Uh, Time Suck Varsity Jack in the store today at badmagicmerch.com for anyone who wants to add some, some prep to their suck, to their fall. And once again, we've flown through the announcements. Uh, only other thing I want to add before we jump into today's show is a little bit of comedy. Uh, a, a funny recent review of Time Suck on Apple Podcasts. Last week's Hollow Earth Theory episode has, uh, has pissed some people off, which I find highly amusing. Uh, it did not amuse Benjamin Brow, who gave Time Suck two stars. I'm surprised he gave us two. It feels like a one-star uh, rating. Because he writes, if you're looking for commentary that agrees with the mainstream narrative of history and, quote, science, this is the podcast for you. Basically an audio version of Wikipedia with jokes. <laughs> 
This review came in hours after the Hollow Earth Theory suck came out. Clearly, Ben did not care for me shitting on the possibility of a whole other world existing beneath us. I just love that he wrote science in quotes. Like uh, like it's a fucking up for debate. Oh, you saw you believe in oh, science. Okay. <laughs> we have some funny Hollow Earth messages coming in today's Time Sucker updates as well. That was such a fun episode to do. And this one I think I like even more. So let's get to it. It's Russian murder time. Tamara Samsonova arrested in St. Petersburg in 2015 at the age of 68, now 73. Uh, She'll she'll probably never live free again. The possibility is out there that she could, which is terrifying. Uh, Arrested for two murders. She's currently under investigation for 14 murders, we think. The numbers are a little fuzzy. Uh, Why they're fuzzy will be made clear later on, mostly because uh, Russia. Uh, Despite the fact that Tamara Samsonova never had any children, the Western world nicknamed her the Granny Ripper. It's catchy. I get it. Uh, She is who the space lizards have chosen for us to suck upon today. Hail the space lizards and their dark preferences. In the Russian press, Samsonova uh, has been given several nicknames, uh, including Babushka Yaga, a pun on the supernatural monster of Slavic folklore, Baba Yaga, another solid nickname. Also been called Psycho, less creative, but very apt. Uh, Some news outlets in Russia called Samsonova Chikatilo in a skirt. Also eh, kind of fitting. Uh, Her crimes would be called Nightmare on Dimitrov Street. Uh, as far as nicknames go, this killer killing it. Well done, Russian tabloids. You don't hold back when it comes to sensationalizing uh, crimes. Uh, and they're not wrong. Her crimes are nightmares, were nightmares. Her story reads more uh, like something out of a Grimm Brothers dark fairy tales book than it does uh, the story of a real person. Many people in Russia today remembering the stories of their childhood, the warnings not to go down certain streets or into the woods alone, thought that Samsonova came straight from Russian folklore to wreak havoc on the people of St. Petersburg. A real witch running amongst us. Her tale was a wee bit harder than normal to piece together today because we had to rely almost entirely on Russian sources, specifically local St. Petersburg sources, and they are fucking terrible. Uh, I'm not sure how many days you have to go to school to become a Russian newspaper or tabloid journalist, but it feels like two uh, or maybe three tops. Uh, the papers ran some pretty wild articles about Sam Snova before law enforcement actually released much official information. How many people she may have killed varies quite a bit from article to article. Uh, and either Google Translate really struggles sometimes when converting Russian to English, or some Russian journalists are barely literate. I'm not trying to be inflammatory here. It's just, holy shit, it was hard to read some of these articles. It felt like her story kept getting assigned to the intern or the new guy or something. They wrote some incredibly odd, hard to decipher crazy shit about her. Despite these hindrances, uh, through the various accounts we were able to find, we were able to get more than enough to tell what I think is a very entertaining tale. A tale that is so very deliciously Russian in moments. Russia has yet to let me down when it comes to voyeuristic entertainment value. When it comes to the sheer magnitude of what the fuck is happening. Just moments. A look into the Granny Ripper will lead us into looking into Russia's long-held and current obsession with the occult, black magic, faith healing. And and man, is this side road going to be worth it? Maybe my favorite part of this suck. Russia is just the just the gift that keeps on giving. Keeps delivering some hits. Uh, some highly entertaining Russian wackadoodle beliefs up ahead. So hail Nimrod and thank you uh, for the Russian entertainment blessings you have bestowed upon us this week. Hail Russia. After a dive into her alleged witchery, we will follow Tamara Samsonova's life and times as best we can. And then uh, after our timeline, we'll zoom out from her life. Take a look at some other granny killers across the world. Women whose crimes were written about by journalists who actually seem to have made it past third grade. Uh, there are more uh, uh, lady killers out there than I thought and, and more geriatric lady killers than I thought. Might be looking at your Nana in a new light after this suck. A sleep with one eye open kind of light. Just because she has blue hair, Velcro orthopedic shoes, knows her way around some fresh baked cookies, don't think that means she's uh, harmless. Your grandma might have memories of cutting off the heads of her enemies from when she was a younger lass or from yesterday. Hell, your sweet, sweet Nana might have a fresh head in her fridge right now. Maybe that is the secret ingredient. She puts in her cookies to make them taste oh so good. The one she keeps telling you with a twinkle in her eyes, it's a secret when you ask. Maybe it's, maybe it's not sea salt. Maybe it's not some special brand of brown sugar or extra dark chocolate chips. Maybe it's the decapitated head of an acquaintance. Uh, it's been a long time since we sucked on a female serial killer. Not since July of 2019, the bell gun is suck. Hungy bungy, oof da, oof da. And this is the first time we've sucked on a truly modern female serial killer. Uh, bell Gunnis died over 100 years ago in 1908. The Granny Ripper still alive in a I was going to say well. She's not, she's not alive and well. She's, she doesn't seem to have ever been well. Doesn't seem to have ever been in the fucking ballpark of well. 
Uh, while Tamara Samsonova's story did not get much attention here in the United States, I certainly never heard of her before seeing her on the topic list. Uh, her crimes were front page news in Russia back in 2015. Part of what led to her receiving so much sensationalist press was the sheer brutality of her crimes. She didn't just kill, she butchered. Also, the Granny Ripper appears to have, as I touched on, been very interested in the occult. In one murder, some torn pages from her, quote, book of spells, was found along with the remains of a victim. Creepy. Then those torn pages were determined to have matched the missing, excuse me, the missing pages of a book found in her apartment. Exactly. Fairly incriminating. Uh, details like this got a lot of people in Russia talking. Many people started to think that she was a real life, honest to God, evil witch. Sacrificing, sacrificing uh, Russian souls to appease some sort of dark master. Her crime details played into Russia's longstanding belief in the occult and witchcraft, a belief we're going to look at right now. Turns out that Russia's history with the occult and black magic practices is long and varied. The most widespread religion in Russia today is uh, officially Russian Orthodox Christianity, same as it's been for centuries. Until the 10th century, Slavic people were pagan. But then after the Grand Prince of Kiev, Vladimir Sviatoslavich, a.k.a. Vlad the Great, not the Impaler, converted to Christianity, he began a campaign to baptize Russians' population and worked. He made it the state religion in 987 CE, and by the time the princes of Moscow became czars in the 16th century, the head of the Russian monarchy was a religious figure as well as a political one, as we learned in our Ivan the Terrible Suck. And today, despite decades of anti-religious communism, Russia uh, still, on the surface, very Christian. According to a 2017 survey, 71% of Russians identify as Russian Orthodox. They may not actually go to church, but that's how they identify. But despite being a heavily uh, Christian nation, again, on the surface, even after most of the population became Russian Orthodox centuries ago, many Russian peasants continued to believe in the presence of occult magic. They go to church on Sunday, then work on spells and potions and shit the rest of the week. And I'm only kind of half kidding there. Many still believe in ancient non-Christian occult beliefs. In America, not common for someone to identify as Christian and also go seek their neighborhood sorcerer out to help them with their health or any number of other problems. That's very common in Russia. Wish I had a neighborhood sorcerer. How fun. Uh, when giving someone the lay of the land, you know, telling somebody how the neighborhood is, how fun to be like, oh, that's, uh, that's Dean over there. He used to be a judge. Uh, Jim and Barb next door, they used to be accountants. Uh, those people run the, uh, cycling shop, uh, on East Sherman, the ones that live just right down the street there. Oh, and that guy over there in the corner, that's Pat. He's our local sorcerer. Uh, for many Russians in centuries past, continuing up until today, any personal misfortune, including impotence, illness, death, crop failure, the death of livestock, etc., often construed as an act of witchcraft or of spoiling porcha in centuries past peasants could attempt to defend themselves against witchcraft by turning to magical, magical practitioners who lived in and around their villages. Uh, magical practitioners included healers, fortune tellers, and sorcerers. Three categories. I love that these were three different categories and still are in parts of Russia. <laughs> and then all these people would be hired to defend, you know, uh, you know from, from witches, from the attacks of witches. So there's like healers, fortune tellers, sorcerers, and witches. Uh, one primary difference between healers and sorcerers was the belief that sorcerers derived their powers from an unclean force, which might refer to the assistance of petty demons or the unclean dead, those who had drowned, committed suicide, died unbaptized, or had practiced sorcery while living. I picture the uh, village sorcerer talking shit about the village healer. Like, you know, if you're going to go to one or the other to get like a fucking curse removed or something, just throwing some shade on the, on the, on the business competitors. Are you to tell me you think Dimitri can get rid of witch hex placed on coats? Ha! That so-called healer could not place Band-Aid on paper cut. That crazy talk I hear. Dimitri the healer. Even baby witch placed curse too strong for him to help. No, you need strong sorcerer for Jao. You need master of dark arts. Someone not afraid to get wizard hands dirty. You need me, Fyodor the powerful. Look how tall my wizard hat is. Does Dimitri have tall wizard hat like this? No. He have sad healer sandals. He have old dirty robe. Maybe he do still have old Cain daughter gave him for birthday a few many years back. I'm not lying. Cain pretty cool. But I have smooth black wizard wand. Very cooler. It's not comparison. Look how shiny full of spells it may be. Also, do not tell others, but I like you. I like you very much. I, get, I take a curse off goats for half price. I don't rip you off like the meter guy. I do it for two rubles. In the late 19th, 
early 20th century, uh, perceived fading credibility of the Russian Orthodox Church in the face of rapid industrialization and political upheaval ignited more interest in the occult than Russia had seen in centuries. It appeared to many that Jesus was not helping them. Uh, he wasn't hearing their prayers, so they turned to the gods of old. Interest in the occult cut across political divisions and class lines. Sophisticated occult doctrines coexisted often in the same people or organizations with ideas or practices taken from Kabbalah, Buddhism, yoga, Siberian shamanism, the practices of various mystical, sectarian, and folk beliefs. In no one was this uh, mixture more apparent than in the Russian mystic Madame Helena Blavatsky. We talked about this maniac again a bit last week. Blavatsky. She keeps showing up. Born August 12th, 1831 in Ukraine, Madame Blavatsky became interested in occultism and spiritualism and for many years traveled extensively throughout Asia, Europe, and the U.S. Also claimed to have spent years in India and Tibet studying under H Hindu gurus. Uh, she probably didn't do that. Probably didn't do the Tibet trip. But she made others believe she did. Uh, she left Russia sometime around 1849 at the age of 18. Maybe. She was so unbelievably full of shit, it's hard to take any of her biographies seriously. A lot has been written about her. Almost all of it has been written by people who believe all the crazy shit she claimed. Like the claim that she wrote her first book by, by clairvoyantly seeing the words in the astral plane and jotting them down via automatic writing. Uh-huh. Sounds legit. And who put the words she wrote into the astral plane? Uh, the masters. And who are the masters? I'll answer that in just a second. In 1875, Blavatsky and several other prominent spiritualists formed the Theosophical Society. In 1877, her first major work, Isis Unveiled, was published in it. She criticized the science and religions of her day, asserted that mystical experience was the means to attain true spiritual insight and authority. Uh, as presented by Blavatsky, Theos uh, Theosophy teaches that there is an ancient and secretive brotherhood of spiritual adepts known as the Masters who, although found across the world, are mostly in Tibet. They believe that these masters are attempting to revive knowledge of an ancient religion once found across the world millions of years ago, which will again come to eclipse the existing world religions. According to Blavatsky, the masters are ordinary beings who had developed extraordinary powers and knowledge through long and dedicated practice and study. And these mortals would astral project themselves into the astral plane and commune with each other, and, well, you get it. It's fucking it's crazy. And it makes sense that Blavatsky came from Russia. Growing up in Russia made it much more likely she would come up with this uh, spiritual belief system. New occult systems, including theosophy, were attracting many serious and dedicated adherents from amongst the intellectual and artistic Russian elites in the mid to late 19th century. Spiritualism introduced into Russia in the mid 19th century by two university professors who claimed it was backed by science uh, was just becoming popular as Blavatsky was reaching her, her late teen years. Spiritualism attracted so many adherents in Russia that se seances were even held on a regular basis at the royal court. A special commission headed by the famous chemist Dmitry Mendeleev, inventor of the periodic table of elements, was tasked in 1874 and 1875 with testing the claims of spiritualism. Not surprisingly, he and his commission found that the claims could not be scientifically replicated, tested, verified, nothing. And not surprisingly, also, a uh, few cared what he thought. Stupid scientist! And many continued to believe in witches and sorcerers and mediums, clairvoyants, healers, psychics, etc. The tumultuousness of the early 20th century only brought more people to various spiritual sects as they searched for meaning in an increasingly mechanized and thanks to the Russian Revolution and World War I, an incredibly violent world. After the Soviet government took control, the new communists in charge declared a separation of church and state, nationalized all church-held lands, and then these early administrative measures quickly followed by brutal state-sanctioned persecutions that included the wholesale destruction of churches and the arrest and execution of many church leaders. The Soviet government did not want anyone to find any meaning in anything that was not communism, but not even Stalin and his gulags could eradicate the Russian belief in the occult. Many Russians now carried on with their occult practices in secret. Some even used their occult knowledge to try to take down the Soviet government. 1920, just three years after the Bolsheviks seized power, the Cheka State Security Organization, forerunner to the KGB, was tipped off about a gathering of occultists on the outskirts of Petrograd, now St. Petersburg. According to biophysicist Alexander Jashevsky, who witnessed the Cheka raid, officers burst into the building and arrested the occultists in the middle of their attempt to place literal curses on Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, and Leon Trotsky by concentrating their thoughts on photos of the Soviet leaders. And then, because Russia, these would-be psychic assassins were quickly executed. What an incredibly, uh, A, strange thing to do, and B, be executed for. <laughs> Imagine these occultist kids 
later trying to explain what had happened to their parents. Your dad was killed trying to assassinate Stalin. Yes, and Lenin and Trotsky as well. Holy shit, did, did he get shot off before he died? Uh, he did not have gun. Bomb then, did he try to blow them up? That's incredible. Uh, no, not, not bomb. Uh, knife? He tried to stab them. No, he, he, uh, he stared at the pictures uh, with the evil in his heart. Uh, what? What? He get caught staring at the pictures with bad thought in mind. He, he tried to curse them to death, so they, they catch him and they shot him. <laughs> Russia, so much insanity over the years. If you could get shot for wishing death on the president in America, I'm pretty sure that each and every year, for a lot longer than I've been alive, tens of millions of people would be executed. Uh, it wasn't just the Kremlin's enemies who attempted to use occult powers in the early years of Soviet rule. In the 1920s and 30s, uh, the Bolsheviks skill skillfully adopted rural occult practices and symbols familiar to new newly urbanized peasants and adapted them for use in propaganda. Propaganda posters and slogans referred to unclean forces and purging ceremonies. Lenin was even more direct, denouncing his adversaries as vampires. The Bolsheviks themselves may not have believed in the world of magic. Indeed, they frequently publicly denounced it, but they also incorporated occult and quasi-occult ideas into the mythologies they constructed around leaders like Lenin and Stalin. Superhuman powers of wisdom were attributed to both men, often taking on, particularly in uh, Stalin's case, a near mystical quality. And Stalin himself may have actually turned to occult practices. Although there is no real proof that Stalin himself believed in the occult, there are rumors, have been rumors for years, that the Soviet dictator employed the services of one Natalia Lvova, described as a third-generation witch, the daughter of a self-proclaimed and widely known clairvoyant. Lvova was supposedly summoned to Moscow by Stalin himself in 1930, According to Igor Obolensky, author of the book The Memoirs of Stalin's Mother, Lvova performed rituals and cast spells that protected the leader from the evil eye and the negative influences of his political opponents. As a protective measure against black magic, Lvova reportedly advised Stalin to not be photographed and to not reveal his real date of birth. Be careful, Stalin. There may be witch who seek to hex and curse you. Uh, Shakeups in the Communist Party, which usually meant a trip to the Gulag for the unfortunate official, were whispered to the result. Uh, the result of Stalin and Lvova's black magic Kremlin sessions. Fucking imagine. That's even a more ridiculous fate than those occultists who are executed for uh, trying to curse Stalin. Being sent to the gulag for some witch accusing you of being an enemy of your country. That's some straight up Salem witch trial shit. Except it was happening in the 20th century, not the 17th century. Imagine some armed guards coming into your office or home or you know, wherever, just dragging you off to prison. No trial, no crime. Just uh, the 100% unfounded accusation of some wackadoodle occultist. What are you doing? Get your hands off of me. What did I do? You know what you did, Sergei. You've been conspiring to destroy Russia. Do not deny. We have proof. Our most trusted witch tell us. So crazy that really happened to people less than 100 years ago. Uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union in the 80s, uh, Russians began to openly turn to the occult in droves. Confused, frightened, desperate for ideas to replace the certainties of Marxist-Leninism. Uh, with the state no longer telling them exactly how to live their lives, many Russians looked to the paranormal and the occult for answers. All over Russia, urban witches and wizards set up shop to offer magical services. Very much a, uh, the more things change, the more things stay the same kind of situation. Man, the modern equivalent of witches and wizards in medieval villages. villages. Uh, state television replaced tractor production ports with stuff like psychic healing sessions. I had no idea this was all uh, a thing. No idea that wackadoodles were such big business in Russia in the 80s and 90s. Uh, one big faith healer in Russia this time, a faith healer, uh, and Antoli, Antoli, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Kasparovsky, first became famous in October of 1989. Kasparovsky uh, would appeal to viewers to place pots and pans full of water by their television sets during his show so that their contents would be charged with healing properties by being exposed to his powerful waves of telepathic energy. This is in fucking 1989. A 1990 poll found that 52.3% of respondents believed that Kasparovsky's techniques could cure illnesses. More than half the people who watched this sad fucking clown totally bought his bullshit act. This guy is fucking terrible. He's still alive. He's 81. He's still pulling this shit. I checked out his website. He considers himself to be a psychotherapist. He's not. He's an obvious fraud. Check out this Google translated quote pulled straight from his super janky website. For the first time in history, Anatoly Kasparovsky, remotely, via television, performed psychological anesthesia for three surgical operations. 
to repeat this super miracle, no one in the whole world has succeeded in the past 30 years. Antony carried out an unprecedented cure for about 10 million people in just six hours of television broadcast. No one ever made such a fantastic gift to humanity. He, de <laughs> he demonstrated the possibility of getting rid of organic disease with this most important achievement. He opened a new page in the prevailing medical, philosophical ideas about man, infinitely expanding the list of diseases, the overcoming of which turned out to be possible by psychological methods. Holy shit! How are we not all so super healthy right now? with this incredible and miraculous healer living amongst us. How has he not cured every disease? Why isn't Bill Gates sending this dude to third world countries and healing all the children instead of wasting $10 billion on vaccine research that doesn't have fuck all to do with magic? Yeah, this guy's still going strong. He has over 260,000 YouTube subscribers. He posts new videos every week, usually several. Uh, he still dyes his hair very, very jet black, uh, just like he's done for decades based on old pictures. Uh, he still rocks the same weird Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber bowl cut. Uh, still wears uh, black turtlenecks. Still looks more like a, a Sasha Baron Cohen character than a real fucking person. I wasted way too much time watching this dude's videos on YouTube. Sweet Lord. If you are bored, 10 out of 10 recommend. Download my show notes for this episode via the Time Suck app or at timesuckpodcast.com. Uh, uh, if you need help with the links or the spelling of his name, I need to play you a little chunk of one of his videos. You have to hear this. I can't keep it to myself. It's all in Russian, but I still want you to hear the music. I'll, I'll commentate. I'll set the scene, describe a little bit of it. Uh, this video was shot in Los Angeles in 2010. Yeah, Anatoly is in some kind of sad auditorium of some sort, some kind of multi-purpose room. It reminds me of the one you'd rent from like the city, like one you'd find in the middle of like a city park in LA. I've seen these little spots. No more than maybe 1,000, 1,200 square feet tops. Just him, a few dudes with camcorders, about 15, 20 people, mostly women, look like they're in their 60s, looking to be healed, I guess. Seems like he's not as well known in America as he is or was in Russia. <laughs> check this, check this shit out. No idea where the techno music's going for some reason. One by one, these older people walk towards him, and then he makes a little bop motion with his with his microphone. Kind of kind of half-assed, not real enthusiastic. And these poor, desperate, being taken advantage of seniors just fall to the ground. <laughs> one guy so funny to me, he falls so slowly very carefully lowers himself to the ground after Anatoly hits him with a burst of psychic power. So staged. Uh, it feels like a fucking Borat sketch. It is beyond absurd. <laughs> oh my God. Here's one of the comments underneath this. It's so absurd. I it's, ah, it's, it blows my mind that this is real. Uh, okay, so Google translates uh, this, this following comment. Very, very uh, typical sentiment for the thread based on other ones I translated. I translated, the Google translated. Uh, someone named Sviantyak writes, he worked with mentally ill people in Ukraine. He started to notice improvements on patients with physical conditions too after his treatments. That's how he got into doing healing sessions on TV. Many people got healed in Soviet Union countries by just watching TV, including my relative, whose varicose veins disappear. Whoever says he is connected to Satan never met him, never listened to or understood what he is about. Anatoly is person of future. He's the fucking person of future, guys. Put your fucking heads out of your asses and look at the fucking future. It's Anatoly's there if you'd pay attention. This is insane. Uh, it says he's a psychotherapist, uh, awakening the memory of Norm on a cellular level when person's body comes back to its healthy state as was planned originally by creator. Okay. He talks about laws of universe according to which everything happening on earth and if you learn the laws, you can use them to heal yourself. So much wackadoodle. You just, just use the laws of the universe to start healing yourself already. Wake up and stop being sick, you dummy. Why didn't I? Why am I not doing that? I didn't even need to take a COVID test. I just I should have just fucking called the doctor and be like, hey, can you connect me to the laws of the universe? And they're like, what? You heard me. All right, Illuminati. Stop scamming me. Connect me to the laws of the universe so I can heal myself. Please transfer me to Anatoly. What? I, I want to talk to the future. I need to talk to the future. I need to talk to Anatoly. Oh my God. Uh, Russia, you never stop surprising me. Obviously, after having done the Baba Yaga suck, I knew that Russian folklore was a real thing. Uh, that there used to be a lot of different superstitious beliefs and that some carried over to the present day. Having done the Rasputin suck, I knew there was a history of mysticism in Russia, but for some reason, this still all caught me off guard. I didn't know that in post-communist Russia, 
there was a resurgence of belief in people like faith healers and witches. And for the super killer suck on Alexander Solonik, and now this one, I, I got to say, I think 80s, 90s Russia, it's my favorite Russian era. Uh, Russia's new government even seemed to sanction these strange beliefs in the 90s. President Yeltsin gave the green light to a number of bizarre projects, including one that saw state funds pumped into a scheme to, quote, extract energy from stones. Huh. And these super crazy beliefs persist to this day, and they are very popular. In Russia, at least as recently as 10 years ago, there were more faith healers than professional medical doctors. You heard that right. In 2010, a psychologist with the Russian Academy of Sciences cited World Health Organization data that indicated there were more occult faith healers in Russia, roughly 800,000, than actual doctors, roughly 640,000. Why does this make me feel better about all the lunatics in America? Our nation isn't the only one full of hundreds of thousands of people with the critical thinking abilities of lemmings. Uh, Russians today spend billions a year on the occult. In 2013, the country's leading cardiologist complained that his fellow citizens spent uh, roughly $26 billion in U.S. money every year on a variety of magical and paranormal services. Here's another stat to show how culturally pervasive all of this is. Russia's Academy of Sciences recently estimated that 67% of all Russian women have at one time or another sought help from a, quote, psychic or sorcerer. I, I love that they keep saying sorcerer. Uh, the figure for Russian men, one in four. <laughs> God, every, every time that they, like, I hear a sorcerer in this uh, suck about Russia, I picture like a, like a Russian Gandalf. Like some dude with like an old school Adidas tracksuit, gold medallion necklace, and a Merlin wizard hat. I feel or the powerful. You're wise to seek my service. You have problem with stomach care? I know how to fix. I give you amulet of digestion. Look how nice. It's real amethyst. It's 14 karat gold. You have problem with neighbor? I fix. Bring in picture. I have wife place curse. No problem. She witch. She, my wife is witch. This week we offer buy one curse, get one fire elemental conjure spell for free. It's the best deal in town. It's 10 times good as chump, fake ass healer Dimitri could give. Uh, some think that one of the reasons that many Russians turn to the occult, specifically for health-related issues recently, is because that Russia's medical system is uh, notoriously bad. In many parts of the country, has been for quite some time. Why risk a dangerous botched operation when you can go to a psychic healer or a fucking sorcerer? And they'll just tell you what you want to hear and not slice you up. Okay, a couple quick uh, more examples, or a couple more quick examples uh, to provide a bit more context, illustrating how the Granny Ripper being associated with the occult, being thought of as a witch, not weird or atypical in Russia. Uh, in recent years. Pretty par for the course, actually. Ever heard of uh, Grigory Grabovoy? If you have, I'm guessing you're Russian or you spent considerable time in Russia. This dude's claims are unreal. He goes big. This guy crazier uh, <laughs> than the faith healer and techno beat dropper, Anatoly uh, Kasparovsky. Ah, his last name kills me. According to his website, uh, www.grigory-grabovoy.ru uh, the 56-year-old has cured tens of thousands of people in the late stages of suffering from AIDS. Huh? Weird how that didn't become the single biggest story of the last 50 years worldwide. Dude can just straight up use wizard powers to blast AIDS right out of your body. Uh, using his clairvoyance, he claims to have located Atlantis. <laughs> He's also examined extraterrestrial spacecrafts and given his findings to the Russian military. Uh, he has also regenerated destroyed matter, whatever the fuck that means. He does all works aimed to prevent catastrophes through creation without destruction. He remote controls matter from any distance. <laughs> and he has cured hundreds of diseased persons with his personal presence. And so much more. Several additional paragraphs of outlandish claims. Basically, it sounds like he's who God must pray to. Like if God can't fix something, he hits up good old Grigory Grabovoy, 100th level Russian sorcerer. And check out what this shady son of a bitch did in 2004. That year, Grabovoy made headlines across Russia with an offer to physically resurrect dozens of children killed during the bloody conclusion to the Beslan school siege when Russian security forces used flamethrowers and tanks to attack militants who'd seized a North uh, Caucasus school. Grabovoy was asking for $1,500, oh my God, per resurrection. If you're not familiar with the Beslan school siege, it's beyond tragic. Uh, in, on September 1st, 2004, armed Chechen rebels took approximately 1,200 children and adults hostage at a school in Besland, North Ossetia, Russia, at approximately 9 a.m. local time. The siege ended on September 3rd with more than 330 killed, including 186 children and more than 700 people wounded. Out of their minds with despair, many of the bereaved mothers turned to Grabovoy, the grief vampire, 
and attended his lectures and resurrection sessions in Moscow. What a colossal piece of shit. These people just lost their children. Almost 200 kids die in a fucking gunfight. And this guy thinks, this is great. Nadia, how fast can you make new flyers printed? Most fucked up thing of all is that uh, even though he took uh, money for over 80 kids, he only brought 20 of them back from the dead. And look, I realize you could argue how amazing he brought back anyone at all, but I think you're missing the point. You know, it's like he, if he's going to promise to bring all the kids back, then he should have brought all the kids back and he didn't bring back anyone. You knew that. That was terrible. Big, big on Lucifina. Too soon. I didn't, I don't need your help making repulsive statements. Uh, obviously, none of the kids were brought back. No part of me believes this guy thought he could bring them back. If, <laughs> if he could bring back kids from the dead, why, why wasn't he already working, you know, years before this Beslan siege? Why wasn't he working at like a kid's children's hospital? Just hanging out and correcting anything the doctors couldn't fix. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Turgenev, uh, sorry to say, we lost your son on operating table. But do not be sad. Grigory Grabovoy, bring him right back. Good as new. You just need to pay him $1,500. I'll be honest. I'm not sure why I work here. Kids should just see Grigory first. Uh, the public was rightfully outraged. This was too much even for fucking wizard happy Russia. Grabovoy was arrested for fraud in 2006, sentenced to 11 years in jail, cut to eight on appeal. While the government arrests this guy for, <laughs> for insane sorcerer claims, uh, many in the Russian government apparently also were seeking help from the occult uh, and still do. One Russian psychic told a Western journalist in 2015 that government officials come to her on a regular basis to help them make big decisions. They come in the middle of the night, she says, uh, so that no one will see them. I can't name names, of course, but Russian government officials always consult sorcerers before, taking major, before making major decisions. Now, is she telling the truth? I mean, I don't know. How credible can a Russian psychic be? Or Russian sorcerer, excuse me. Probably not the, the most credible. But if there's no fire where the Russian government's reliance on the occult is concerned, there sure is a lot of smoke, which is weird. Uh, Marina, a different psychic sorceress. <laughs> yeah, I guess I shouldn't have called the last person a source. sorceress. Uh, based in Southeast Moscow, told the same journalist, whenever there are big international talks going on, Russia always brings a psychic or a witch along to influence things. Look at Rasputin. He was the greatest magician we have ever seen. Russian leaders have always employed occultists. So does Putin have a personal wizard, a sorcerer, a sorceress? Does he consult his uh, sorcerer about how best to fuck with America through various disinformation campaigns? He literally might. Would not be surprised at all. Okay, I think I've made it abundantly clear now. The occult is alive and well in Russia, has been for quite some time. I just really wanted to establish that, and I just thought it was very entertaining uh, before we dove into the Granny Ripper's tale. She was not some random outcast witch looking to grind children's bones into bread. She was one of millions of Russians who turned to the occult to make sense of the world around her. She was also, uh, it appears, a highly unstable uh, schizophrenic, which probably helped get her more into the, uh, the witchery. Uh, flashbacks to the vampire of Sacramento here. Please let us not find out. She also used a baby's penis for a straw. Uh, the widespread Russian reliance on sorcerers and a belief in the power of magic and spells is also important to understand because it undoubtedly influenced how the Russian media reported on her case. Many of the journalists who wrote about her are likely superstitious, supernatural believers as well. Keep that in mind as we march down her time suck timeline. Yeah, yeah, electrico, yeah. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On April 25th, 1947, Tamara Mitrovanova Samsonova was born in the Russian city of Uzhur, now part of the Krasnoyarsk territory, almost 4,500 kilometers, about 2,800 miles from where she would commit her crimes in St. Petersburg. Uh, 1947, not a great year overall for the Soviet Union. Last major famine to hit the USSR began in July of 1946, reaching its peak in February of 47 lasting until August of that year before quickly diminishing in intensity, although there, will, there were still famine deaths in 1948. Uh, between 1946 and 1947, there were a minimum of 115,000 to uh, a maximum of around 300,000 deaths linked to starvation. The Cold War had also officially kicked off in 1946. Winston Churchill warned that an iron curtain was descending to the middle of Europe. Joseph Stalin deepened the estrangement between the U.S. and the Soviet Union when he asserted in 1946 that World War II was an unavoidable and inevitable consequence of capitalist imperialism and implied that a uh, war, such you know, war, similar war, might reoccur, stoking the, the big red fear of World War III. On March 12, 1947, just over a month before uh, Tamara's birth, President Harry Truman delivered a speech before Congress that marked the beginning of the Truman Doctrine 
which held that the U.S. could no longer stand by and allow the forcible expansion of Soviet totalitarianism into free independent nations. The Truman Doctrine emphasized that communism would be contained. Secret police, which had been renamed in 1946 to the MGB, the Ministry of State Security, enforced rigid conformity in the satellite states of Eastern Europe and infiltrated and destroyed anti-communist, anti-Soviet, or independent thinking groups. The intelligent apparatus was able to permeate every level and branch of state administration with agents planted in collective farms, factories, and local governments, as well as throughout the upper level and rank and file of Soviet bureaucracy. Each department within the government also had their own official supervisor, a special section staffed by the MGB to keep tabs on and regulate the employees, ensure the absence of disloyalty. It was a version of Gilead from The Handmaid's Tale. No religion, but the same amount of fear and paranoia and control akin to George Orwell's 1984. Uh, we don't know much about Samsonova's childhood in Uzur. Uh, Uzur was founded in 1760 wasn't officially made a town until 1953. Today, it's a small city, just over 16,000 people. Doesn't seem to be a uh, super cool city. Doesn't seem to be a well-touristed uh, city. According to TripAdvisor, its top attraction is the Springs of Happiness. Based on pictures, it's a very small mineral spring with a little spigot where you can fill up a water jug. Probably use that magical mineral water for some kind of wizard or sorcerer spell. It's very sad looking, doesn't look that happy, and it's the, literally the only attraction listed in Uzur by TripAdvisor. Uh, we also don't have uh, much information about Samsonova's parents. Her father was apparently a police officer. In one article, we found Samsonova said that her father walked with a weapon, whatever that means. Or what kind of weapon he walked with. Uh, what, if, what if it was an axe? My mind went there when I first read that. Just like how interesting and terrifying would that be to see a police officer just carrying a double-bladed war axe? Why is that so much scarier to me than a, than a gun? Probably because like with a gun... You could theoretically, you could shoot to wound and not necessarily shoot to kill. I don't, I don't think you can do that with a war axe. I'm pretty sure when you're, when you're swinging a war axe, you're always slicing to kill. Uh, as for Samsonova's mother, all we could find on her was, it, was she, uh, she worked somewhere in the trade, whatever that means. According to Wikipedia, Uzur's local industry is based on agriculture and dairy farming. So perhaps she uh, worked on a dairy farm or out in some other field. Uh, in the later 1960s, after graduating from high school, or excuse me, in the late 1960s, after graduating from high school, Tamara moved to Moscow, enrolled at the Moscow State Linguistic University, the largest and the oldest university in Russia that specializes in linguistics and foreign languages. Here she studied uh, various foreign languages and became fluent, or at least you know somewhat fluent in German and English. After graduating, a few sources say she worked as a foreign language teacher in a kindergarten. This is the first of her oh-so-many jobs. Her changing jobs killed me. First time I looked through all this. So many good jobs coming up. It gets so very Russian. It's, oh, I can't wait. Uh, around 1971, when Samsonova would have been 24, she marries a man named Alexei Leonid uh, Samsonov. This poor son of a bitch. His story is preposterously sad. Uh, isn't much on poor Mr. Samsonov either. They would have no children. He was described in one source, and this will be by far his most flattering description, as a very quiet man who worked at a car repair plant. Uh, according to Samsonova, their relationship was good. She said during, during an interrogation after her capture, I was like a mother to him. He is like a son to me. Huh. So maybe instead of good, uh, she should have said creepy. I don't think Lindsay would like me describing our marriage that way. I love my wife. Uh, we, no, we have a good relationship. She's like, she's like, a, uh, she's like a daughter to me. Uh, please, dear Meat Sack, please start describing your romantic partners that way to uh, new people you meet. Uh, report back to me on how well it goes. This is my husband, Frank. <laughs> so hard not to introduce him as my son. He, he really is like a son to me. Just a sexy fucking son. Uh, according to their former neighbors, their relationship was a little less than good. A little less mother and son. Maybe a little more abusive kidnapper and scared hostage. Neighbors said that Samsonova muffled Alexei. Sometimes wouldn't let him come home. When she was especially furious with him for reasons that are never disclosed, Alexei would apparently have to go. <laughs> I know this is not funny. But it's funny to me. Alexei would apparently have to go sit on a park bench near their apartment until it was dark. And if he was in a lot of trouble, he'd have to sleep there overnight. Uh, one neighbor described him. <laughs> this maybe is my favorite description of anyone ever. In one simple sentence. One neighbor described him as, quote, pitiful, thin, red-haired, and toothless with a rag bag. <laughs> what is fucking what? Toothless? Rag? What's a rag bag? Sounds like the saddest son of a bitch who ever lived. You heading home? You heading home, Alexi? No. Heading to the park again. I'm going to try and find something soft to eat. 
and I guess I'll just curl up in my rag bag and cry myself to sleep. And I love how in the midst of that very derogatory description, red hair is thrown in. Gingers. Always getting some shade. Uh, after they got married, Sam Sanova and Alexi hopped on, I'm guessing, uh, a train, as most people would travel, uh, headed west, really far west, settling in a newly built panel house in apartment number four on Dimitrov Street in Cochino, a little village in the suburbs of what was then Leningrad, what is now St. Petersburg. Their small, drab, communist living unit on the first floor. Once in Leningrad, Sam Sanova first works at a hospital. Sources don't say exactly what her job was there. After a while, she gets a new job as a floor attendant at a hotel now called Hotel Europe. I feel like floor attendant is basically like concierge. Uh, she helped guests find stuff to do in the area, told them where, where to go, maybe helped them check into the rooms. Uh, the hotel was located in the center of the city. Tourists from all over the world came there, allowing Samsonova to make use of her foreign language skills. Later, there'd be a lot of theories about Samsonova's time at the hotel. Some articles say she worked as a prostitute. Others say she was a prostitute informant for the KGB. According to a couple Russian news outlets, uh, the Grand Ripper took on another job in the, uh, in the early 80s. She became a blacksmith. Uh, huh. Okay. What a strange career move from working in a hospital to working in a hotel to being a fucking blacksmith. Russia seeking out sorcerers in the eighties and having blacksmiths. It's also very medieval. Uh, she was also apparently a bit of an entrepreneur during the eighties and nineties. She would later say, I bought foreign jeans and sweaters, which were scarce at the time from foreigners and resold them from what we could find out. She sold them right out of her apartment. So she's a blacksmith and she's selling jeans and sweaters from her apartment. Hello, my name is Tamara Samsonova, local blacksmith. We're not hammering out swords for local sorcerers. You can find me in my apartment selling jeans and sweaters. I'm also a witch. If you need sword or chainmail or cardigan or jorts or witch potion, come to Dimitro Street. Visit Babushka Yaga. Uh, in the 90s, <laughs> this is even better, Samsonova stopped selling jeans and sweaters and started selling vodka out of her apartment. <laughs> One Russian news source wrote that all the boozers around her knew her apartment on the first floor. That's the most Russian shit I've ever read in my life. <laughs> Hello, my name is Tamira Samsonova, local blacksmith. We're not hammering out swords for local sorcerers. You can find me in my apartment where I no longer sell jean or sweater. I sell vodka because Russia. Also, I'm witch. Please visit Babushka. Yeah. Uh, a neighbor said that people were always stopping by her apartment and that her patrons would usually drink their booze on a bench nearby. I hope she was distilling that shit in her kitchen. Or better yet, making poor Alexi do it. Alexi, put scrawny back into mashed potato, you pitiful ginger. Not enough barley. And the mashed potatoes not for you eating, you toothless mudik. Much faster, sleep outside tonight on the rag bag. Uh, the first reliable information about Samsonova's past starts around 1996 when Samsonova visits a psychiatrist whom investigators would later question about her mental health. This, this next sequence is also so fucking ridiculous. Apparently, Samsonova came to the psychiatrist's office voluntarily on numerous occasions, <laughs> was often accompanied by her sad husband. The doctor noted that Tamara, uh, Tamara uh, appeared, quote, bright, lively, and erudite, while her husband appeared poor, downtrodden, and moronic. It just keeps getting better with this guy. Samsonova's husband is a pitiful, poor, thin, downtrodden, red-haired, toothless, ginger moron. I wonder what their counseling sessions were like. Tamara, you seem upset with Alexi. What is that? I'm so frustrated with my husband's son. He's stupid. He puts too much barley in the apartment of vodka. I punish him by, by making him sleep in the park on the rag bag, but he still have no teeth. Still, he have red head. It makes me so angry. Alexi, how do you feel when Tamara speak about you that way? She's right. I let everyone down. I'd like to leave my session now, just go lay down and cry on my rag bag. Uh, in addition to bright, lively, and erudite, Samsonova also appeared to the doctor as a wayward, absurd, and capricious woman. She also told the doctor she often shoplifted, and he also, for reasons that are never made clear, uh, went from having a professional relationship with her to a personal one. They started talking on the phone. The doctor even visited Samsonova's apartment once, saying he just went there to get this, uh, this book, this Gulag Archipelago. <laughs> what the fuck? Why would the doctor go into a patient's home? Get a book? I don't buy that. He, he could buy that book. Check it out from the library. Seems super shady for your counselor to be swinging by your house to grab a book. This feels like bullshit to me. I think they were sleeping together. Pure speculation. That's what I think. His final analysis was that she was an intelligent and secretive woman with a sophisticated intellect. 
and sweet pussy. Now, I don't know. I just I do think they're probably sleeping together. At the turn of the century, when Tamara or Tamara would have been uh, 53, most sources believe the Granny Ripper started her killing spree. It's believed that. I don't think this will surprise anyone. She killed her poor ginger husband's son, Alexi. Uh, 53 years old, starting so much later in life than most serial killers, uh, female killers do tend to start killing later than their male counterparts. Uh, for male serial killers, the average age when they first kill is 27 and a half. For females, it is 31. Man, and poor Alexi. M must be the saddest husband we've covered so far on the show. Sadder than any of Bell Gunness' murdered husbands. I hope, I hope he's sleeping on, a, on the nicest rag bag any ginger's ever sleeping on ever in, ever in ginger heaven. Uh, after falling off the face of the earth, it doesn't seem like anyone ever really looked for him. Uh, after Alexi disappeared, Sam Snova uh, did reach out to the police, whose subsequent searches yielded nothing. I guess there's a chance that uh, he really did get tired of her shit, just you know, finally wandered off. I hope so. Hope he went out looking for some new teeth. I doubt it. When asked about her husband, she would tell you, say to her neighbors that he was uh, he was likely chasing after other women. She also didn't seem to lose any sleep over his disappearance. She told her neighbors that uh, she's better off without him. Uh, later neighbors recalled that there were suspiciously uh, a variety of different versions of the story of his disappearance. Sometimes she said that he left me. Other times she said he died of cirrhosis of the liver. Very different story. Uh, other times she said he went to the savings bank and did not return. Uh, sometimes she said, uh, I poisoned ginger husband's son with witch potion. Uh, sometimes she said, he run off with shrub sluts uh, he find in forest. <laughs> I tried to place curse on forest names on uh, dirty shrub slut for many year. Okay, maybe she didn't say those last few. Uh, and if you're confused, shrub slut is just a little joke from the Richard Chase Vampire of Sacramento episode. After her husband's disappearance, Sam Sonova got yet another job. Now she worked as a caregiver for the elderly in the area. Nice. Seems like it's going to work out good. Uh, I wonder how honest she was about her previous employers during her job interview. Uh, what I work before, I have, well, I have many jobs. I, I help guests at nice hotel. I maybe sometimes prostitute for KGB. I maybe make a war hammer and the wizard sword and blacksmith shop a little bit. I sell illegal sweater and jean shorts. I teach kindergarten. I sell apartment vodka to park drunks. Maybe kill husband's son a little bit. Uh, I feel very ready to be good at caregiver. I write witch. I mean woman, not witch, for job. Uh, according, to, I have no idea what that accent became by the end of that. Uh, according to Russian officials, Samsonova had seven or eight different jobs before she was arrested in 2015. Typically, typically didn't keep any of her jobs for more than three, four years. Uh, she also, in the years leading up to her arrest, began renting out a room in her St. Petersburg apartment to make extra money. Still living in the same place she'd moved into decades earlier. According to her diary and interviews with neighbors, she'd often, she often didn't like the people who would rent from her and stay with her. She'd get mad at them for using her kitchen and the bathroom and complain that everyone was dirty. Based on her diary, when she wasn't working, she spent a lot of her free time uh, either drinking coffee or uh, or killing people. She was also a super fan of Russia's most notorious serial killer, the first Russian murder we sucked, Andrei Chikatilo. Later authorities would discover that she collected articles and books about Chikatilo, the prolific killer convicted of killing 52 men and women and children between 78 and 1990. A little bit disturbing. What is big deal? I have many fans. People that love the Chikatilo, they love the greatest wrestler. Russia ever produce. I should have married that witch. We make a great team. Russia power couple. Hashtag couple goals. I hip, I hip to new lingo. I go jerk soft stream cock and corner now. I, I bother no one. You forget I hear. Uh, I'm back now. Old suck character, new listener. Uh, if Samsonova did kill her husband in 2000, it was not the only murder she committed that year. Uh, Samsonova would for sure, it seems, kill one of her tenants, a man named Volodoya, in November of 2000. In her diary, she seems to have made this abundantly clear. She wrote, pretty direct here, I killed my tennis Voltoya. <laughs> so I just love that she fucking wrote it that directly. Ah, I, think she, I think maybe she did it. Let's look at her diary. I kill him for sure. Uh, no, she wrote, I killed my tenant Voltoya, uh, cut him to pieces in the bathroom with a knife, put the pieces of his body in plastic bags, threw them away in different parts of the Fuzinski district. So, you know, so there you go. Doesn't leave a lot to speculation. Well, it, it may. She, she was mentally ill, and it would come out later that not all of her diary entries were completely truthful, but very suspicious that this dude moves in with her and then quickly disappears, and then, you know, she wrote that. Around this time, a new neighbor, Marina Nikolaevna, and her husband move in next door. Marina would later tell a Russian news outlet, we did not have a landline telephone then. I had to call from neighbors. The first one I knocked on was Tamara Samsonova. We drank coffee in the kitchen and talked. Even then, she was weird. She talked about her husband, that he left and did not return. At the same time, at that moment, Tamara had some kind of joy in her eyes. 
according to Marina Samsonova, like to uh, sit topless near her window. And this really pissed Marina off. <laughs> I know this is a weird turn there. Uh, Marina's husband uh, was a big fan of uh, Samsonova's apparently attractive physique. And uh, Marina often caught him peeping on her. Hard to believe that she was some lust-inducing vixen if you look at pictures of her uh, that were taken around the time of her arrest. She literally looks like someone who was just cast as a witch in a local play. No makeup required, already fucking nailing it. Like, she looks she looks like a, like a straight-up witch. She looks like she hasn't used any skincare products on her face fucking ever. And she's just laid out under the hot sun for about 16 hours a day. She looks like she lived on uh, cigarettes and vodka and spiders and eyes of newt or whatever else a witch eats for many years. But if you look further, you can find pictures from her years past. And she was at one point very attractive. I only point this out because if I was familiar with her picture and I heard that, if I, if I was listening, if I had only seen a picture, I'd be like, get the fuck out of here. There's no way. Uh, Marina, not surprisingly, not a big fan again of her husband checking out Babushka Yaga. Makes sense. I doubt a lot of wives love that sort of thing. Other than showing off the goods, hey, Lucifina, uh, Marina did not have a problem with her. Never heard screams. Never heard it sounds. She later associated with murder. Uh, man, other than the killing, Samsonova, I got to say, sounds like a super entertaining neighbor, right? Sometimes she sells vodka. Sometimes she sells jeans. And sometimes she whips out her sweet babushka boobs, hangs out by the window. In comparison, my neighbors are fucking boring. I have a couple older ladies living around me, and not one of them, to my knowledge, ever lounges around with their sweet tatas out. They don't sell apartment vodka. Why can't just one time I live somewhere where I can walk next door and buy some homemade vodka from my topless geriatric neighbor? Uh, while never suspecting her neighbor of murder, Marina did, however, make note of her weird neighbor's paranoia. On several occasions, Marina would be having a conversation with Samsonova in Samsonova's apartment, and then Samsonova would interrupt her and run over and look through the peephole. Uh, Marina, <laughs> Marina also later recalled that she opened the door for me only if I knocked in a special prearranged manner. Again, so much more exciting than any of my neighbors. I'm probably the weirdest neighbor in my neighborhood. Maybe I should take it further. Give, uh, give other people stuff to talk about. Maybe I should start lounging around with my dick out, you know? Maybe make some homemade vodka myself. Uh, why didn't Samsonova just let anyone in? She told Marina that someone had been constantly sneaking into her house and cutting up her clothes. Once she showed Marina a robe and Marina immediately recognized there were not any cuts in the robe, just a hole that had formed from regular wear and tear. Uh, according to another neighbor, Tamara's apartment also didn't even have a sofa or a refrigerator. Did I mention she was mentally ill? She was mentally ill. Uh, not criminally insane, perhaps, but a long ways from well. If you think someone is sneaking into your place to cut holes in your clothes, please, first, get a new lock. Then if it keeps happening, get a counselor and do what they tell you. Uh, we're all very worried about you. Uh, in the summer of 2001, a man named Vladimir settled in with Tamara. Tam I can never make up my mind. Tamara, Tamara. Uh, Tamara, he rented out uh, one of the one of her rooms despite their almost 20 year age difference they began a physical relationship i bet this lady was absolutely fucking buck wild in bed am i the only one thinking that uh, a month or two later vladimir calls off the fling but keeps living in their shared apartment i can only imagine what being in a romantic relationship with samsonova must have been like at that point Man, no wonder he, he had to break off the romantic relationship like if she thinks that someone's been seeking to her place to cut holes in her clothes what, what is she accusing like somebody she's you know dating of Tell truth, you tried to set fire of my pubic hair last night when I sleep. Tell truth, you spend too much time in park. Are you sexing with the shrub sluts? I know about shrub sluts who hide in park bush. Tell truth. Uh, in December of 2001, Vladimir is admitted to the hospital with symptoms of poisoning. The doctors can't establish which particular drug is causing his problems. Vladimir thinks he knows the source, though. He suspects his roommate, which former lover lady. When he's discharged from the hospital, he immediately moves out of tomorrow's apartment. September 6, 2003, the granny killer, Granny Ripper, she's also known as the granny killer, uh, seems to have claimed her second victim, maybe her third. Uh, Sergei Potanyan was a 44-year-old from Norilsk. 44-year-old. Uh, was uh, very, unfortunately for him, renting Samsonova's empty room. He had tattoos on his shoulder, a skull, a snake, a few other symbols that would make it easy for investigators to later identify his remains. Samsonova would make note of these tattoos in her diary. Apparently, Samsonova didn't enjoy her new roommate's company, and she poured some nitrazepam, a powerful sedative and uh, omnest omnest ugh, omnestic, into his cold borscht and managed to overpower him. Putting poison in some cold borscht. Uh, that's almost as Russian as selling apartment vodka. After Sergei was unconscious, she dismembered his corpse and disposed of it on the street. Investigators, based on interviews with Tamara, felt that there was a good chance she started cutting while he was still alive which would seem to be a habit of hers. Jesus Christ. 
His body, or at least his torso, would be found in an empty lot near tomorrow's apartment, and at the time, investigators would have no clue who'd left it there. Along with the body, investigators found some pages ripped from an esoteric book of black magic. Man, a serial killer doing that shit in America? That would get so much press. Oh my God, a whole new satanic panic would kick off. Uh, later in 2003, Sam Sonova meets another man, Alexander Barshev, uh, Bar- Barishev, uh, while working along Sadovia Street. Alexander was out with his common-law wife, Larissa, while Sam Sonova was with a young man named Gennady. The two couples hit it off, kept in touch afterwards with Sam Sonova calling Larissa a few times a week, chatting on the phone. Gradually, Larissa's husband, Alexander, begins to pick up the phone more and more often when Sam Sonova calls. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Then out of nowhere, seemingly, Sam Sonova tells Alexander and Larissa that her young boyfriend, Gennady, has died. No one seems to know what, uh, no one seems to know what happened to him. I'm guessing she killed him. And no one's ever found his body. Guessing. It's a hunch. A few months later, in early 2004, Alexander decides it is the season of the witch. About a year after meeting Samsonova, Alexander leaves his wife of seven years and moves into Samsonova's apartment. This lady had game. Things didn't seem to have worked out very well for Alexander in his new digs. Alexander apparently called his wife, Larissa, several times, two or three days after moving in. Then he called her again about a week later, and their conversation was abruptly interrupted. No more details are given. Then he is never heard from or seen again. Years later, when Sam Snow was arrested, she first claimed that she did kill Alexander, then later recanted saying, I was joking. It's, a, it's illegal to make little jokes now? Yes, I kill some people, but not him. Ha. Yes, I like to confess, but that's your sense of humor. Uh, partially because his body has never been found, uh, she's yet to be charged with his murder. In 2011, a study on serial killing women is published by the American Journal of Forensic Psychology, and the conclusions it comes to seem to apply greatly to Samsonova. The study says that as opposed to men, killer women tend to operate more under the radar, less likely to have a criminal history. They tend to kill those closest to them. Uh, They use quieter methods of elimination like poison, drugs, or smothering. As a result, their killing careers generally last much longer than men, on average between 8 and 11 years in comparison to 2 years for male serial killers. Female serial killers have an average of nine victims. Uh, Samsonova fit this typology to a T. Most seem to believe that from 2000 to 2015, Samsonova killed uh, 13 or 14 people. And while neighbors didn't seem to suspect her of murder until 2015, they also uh, didn't seem to really care for her. As she got older, she began to quarrel with neighbors more and more often, even got physical with them when she was upset. Uh, She also was just fucking weird doing stuff like hanging around naked with the curtains pulled back. Uh, walking around barefoot outside, even in the winter. Uh, it's, at one point, a few of her neighbors got together, wrote up a statement that they sent to a psychiatric hospital saying she needed to be treated. And uh, they were able to get her committed for a few months. Then she was back and uh, moved back into her apartment. Uh, let's now fast forward to 2015. We just don't unfortunately have details on who uh, she may or may not have killed between 2005 and 2015. Uh, St. Petersburg, big, beautiful Russian port city on the Baltic Sea with a population of just under 5 million. Founded in 1703 by Peter the Great, the imperial capital for two centuries, the hometown of Vladimir Putin, that dirtbag. Going to have to suck that guy one of these days. Uh, The city has been called St. Petersburg from its founding until the government changed the name to Petrograd in 1914. 1924, the communists had it named Leningrad, and then the original name was restored in 1991. St. Petersburg, uh, Russia's cultural center with more than 70 theaters, over 300 museums, including the State Russian Museum, which showcases Russian art from Orthodox icon paintings to Kadinsky works. It's amongst the oldest museums in the world, as well as one of the largest. Three million people visit a year. The city's famous for its white nights, which peak in number during the southern months because St. Petersburg's so far north during the summer, the sun is up until around midnight, rises again around three or four in the morning. And the city has seen its share of crazy shit over the years because Russia... Uh, But 2015 would be an exceptionally weird year even for St. Petersburg. The Granny Ripper would dominate newspaper headlines. In March of 2015, Sam Sonova, just shy of 68 years old now, still working as a caregiver, still living on Dimitro Street, and she meets 79-year-old Valentina Ulanova, who also lived on Dimitro Street. Ulanova, described by those who knew her as an intelligent and kind woman, always willing to help someone out. People said she'd even buy booze for some of the transients in the area. And I love how that's a sign of being a good Samaritan in Russia. She great lady. She buy vodka for homeless people in parks. Everything's fucking vodka. Uh, Samsonova's apartment was being renovated, so a mutual friend asked Ulanova if Samsonova could stay with her for a while. And Ul- Ulanova, you know, having no idea this lady was fucking Babushka Yaga, uh, agreed. Two women seemed to have a lot in common. Both had arrived in St. Petersburg in 1973, uh, lived in newly constructed buildings on Dimitrov Street. Both had no kids, 
both buried their husbands around the turn of the century. Uh, you know, pretty similar. I mean, sure, one of them, you know, most likely killed her husband. The other husband was probably not murdered, but, you know, guessing Sam Simpson probably left those details out when bonding with her new friend. Uh, they both lived alone in almost identical two-room old communist apartments in neighboring buildings. Despite their accommodations being almost exactly the same, based on diary entries found later, Sam Sanova wanted Ulanova's apartment. She thought it was better. She felt better there. She thought it was worth killing over. Sam Sanova lived in Ulanova's apartment for several months, and then when it came time for Sam Sanova to move back out, when her apartment was done being renovated, she just straight up refused to leave. In the summer of 2015, poor Ulanova begged Sam Sanova to get the fuck out of her apartment, but she would not budge. She could not get this lady out of her place. I'm sure she thought she had the roommate from hell, and she did, but of course, uh, Sam Sanova much worse than Ulanova probably even suspected then. After a conflict over unwashed dishes in late July, on either July 23rd or 24th, Sam Sanova decides she has to kill her roommate, which to be fair does make sense. I mean, she really had no other choice. She's sick and tired of Ulanova having the audacity to keep asking her to get the fuck out of an apartment that's not hers. That's no way to treat an unwanted guest. She was sick of being hassled over leaving dirty dishes on the counter of the apartment. She refused to leave. What else is she supposed to do? Uh, Sam Sanova travels to Pushkin, a town about 36 kilometers, 22 miles away, where she manages to persuade a pharmacist she knows to sell her a prescription drug, finazepam without a prescription. Finazepam, a drug I'm guessing uh, the Granny Ripper pretty familiar with. Uh, used to treat schizophrenia, popular now as a recreational drug, and in high doses, it will knock you the fuck out. It has anesthetic qualities. Upon returning to St. Petersburg, she uh, buys an Olivier salad, one of Ulanova's favorite dishes, basically a Russian potato salad. Later in court, the G-Ripper says the murder went down like this. I came home and poured the whole pack of 50 pills into the Olivier salad. She loves them very much. We agree that it would, I would clean the apartment. I wash everything for an hour and lay down. I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and she is lying on the floor. And I begin to dismember her. Well, there you go. Pretty direct and to the point. She poisoned her roommate's salad, did a little house cleaning, took a nap, woke up and started cutting her to pieces. All, all in a normal day's work. Uh, she dismembered Ulanova with a saw and some kitchen knives right there on the kitchen floor. She actually borrowed the saw from a neighbor. <laughs> wonder how that went down. Excuse me, do you have saw for me to borrow? Uh, something I could use to cut through, uh, how do I say, a couple old lady bones. Uh, authorities are again pretty sure that this poor woman was still alive. During the initial cuts, ugh. First, Samsonova sawed off Ulanova's head. She then took hold of her torso, sawed the body in half. With the knife, she sheared the torso into seven or eight pieces, threw the pieces into bags, removed the head, or I said the head, also removed the hands. Several reports say she put them in a stock pot on the stove and boiled them, the head and the hands. Uh, said later in confession, she did that to prevent identification. Others would think that she boiled her roommate's head and hands, not just to destroy evidence, but also because, you know, she ate them. Babushka Yaga. Once her roommate was cut up into pieces and those pieces had been placed in bags, Samsonova took the bags outside of her apartment to dispose of Ulanova's remains, made several trips to various parts of her neighborhood, stashing a leg here, a torso there, head over yonder. I said most of the bags earlier because Samsonova apparently left some of the parts of the body scattered around the apartment. Then before she uh, even had time to change her clothes after all this, someone comes to the door and rings the doorbell. Samsonova, covered in blood, looks through the peephole, uh, it's a social worker on the other side of the door. Samsonova tells the woman that Ulanova has gone out of town to attend a friend's funeral. The woman asks to be let in. Samsonova tells her that she cannot let her in. She says she doesn't have the keys, doesn't have any keys, which makes no fucking sense. But that's what she said. <laughs> so weird. Sorry, I cannot let you inside. I do not have any keys. Why would you need key if you're already inside? Because, listen, um, we have a special doorknob. And you need a key to get in, like a normal door, but also another key to get out. It's a, it's a double doorknob lock thing, and I don't have the get in or the get out key. So, <laughs> so here we are. Uh, apparently, once the social worker left, Samsonova began washing the floor. The social worker, suspicious regarding Samsonova's nonsensical fucking weird key story, contacted the police. Uh, since the social worker hadn't actually seen the blood and body parts, though, the police wouldn't assign any sense of urgency to investigate in the apartment. And it'd be a few days before they would find pieces of Ulanova's body and then find the Granny Ripper. Uh, before the police arrived, one of Ulanova's friends, Natalia Fedovsky, came by the house looking for the friend she'd affectionately nicknamed Valya. She later recalled, I came to Valya's house and there was only Tamara. She tells me, Valentina has disappeared. 
and before that, on Thursday night, she drank a lot and fell in the hallway. I knew that Valya could drink a glass or two, but no more. Again, I love how it's fucking vodka. It's just every part of this story. Uh, she could not get somewhere. All documents remained at home. On the table were two discharged mobile phones. I also noticed a strange detail. The two refrigerators were on at once. Valya only turned the large refrigerator on when she defrosted the small refrigerator. I did not think to look inside. It's scary to imagine what I could have found. What the fuck is going on in Russia? Is having two refrigerators in a kitchen a normal thing over there? Why? And you only have one on at any given time? I don't. I have never seen two refrigerators in someone's kitchen. If that, that I can recall, on the off chance that I ever saw that, I guarantee that they didn't have one on to keep on, but the other one off. And then they would like when they were defrosting one, they put like what is is just are things so shitty over there that you have to have two refrigerators because one goes on the fritz all the time. Uh, she continues, not finding Valentina, I was going to call the police, but Tamara literally hung on my arm, saying, no need to call. Uh, she remembered Tamara saying, I breathe well here. It's so calm here. I feel so good here. Until Valentina's relatives are found, I'll live here for another six months. Uh, Natalia then asked her, so you know that Valia is no longer alive? And then Salm Sa just got quiet. <laughs> I picture her saying something like, uh, I, I, need you to, I need you to go now. I do not... I do not have enough keys for you to stay here. What was all that breathing well nonsense? Oh, wait, I remember. Uh, she's insane. Uh, Natalia managed to get out of the apartment and correctly suspecting that Sam Snow had killed her friend. She reported Sam Snow to the police, but still, they do not investigate right away. There's no body. This will change soon. On the evening of Sunday, July 26, 2015, one of Sam Snow's neighbors are walking their dog in an empty lot near a pond adjacent to House 10, Building 4 on Dimitrov Street. The lot literally across the road from where Sam Snova and Ulanova live, just behind some garages near the river in a railroad track. There, the neighbor's dog takes particularly uh, to take, excuse me, particular interest in some bushes. Uh, the neighbor goes over to look and see what the dog has found in the bushes and discovers one of those fucking shrub sluts. And the neighbor's like, "Get out of here! Gone!" Between the shrub sluts and the park hobos, fucking up on vodka all day. This neighbor's gone to shit. No, uh, the neighbor went over there to look at the bush and discovered a chunk of body. Wrapped in a shower curtain. The head, arms, legs, some internal organs missing. Uh, my God, she didn't do a very thorough job at, at body disposal, did she? Just wrapped up part of her roommate's remains in a shower curtain, walked across the street, and just threw that shit in a bush. After being alerted to the remains, the police went around the neighborhood, quickly found more. They found a plastic bag with leg in it near Building 6. The only thing that could be said with certainty was that the body belonged to an elderly woman. Then when the police asked uh, some neighbors, talked to some neighbors, several recalled seeing Sam Sonova carrying bags out of Ulanova's apartment and that Ulanova had not been seen since. The next day, July 27th, the police are able to establish the owner of the missing body parts based on more interviews with neighbors. Then when they knock on Ulanova's door, Sam Sonova answers, right? Because she's still staying in the wrong fucking apartment. She explains that she's caring for Ulanova, who almost never leaves the house. And the police insist on entering the apartment, checking out Ulanova, who they know has been killed. The police know damn well she's not taking care of Ulanova. They know she's been cut to pieces. So the police walk in and they walk into a nightmare. In the bathroom, there's the borrowed bloody hacksaw. There's traces of blood all over the walls. There's organs in the fridge. Almost immediately, Samsonova confesses. She explains, and I'm not making this up, that Valentina Ulanova insulted her terribly. So obviously she had to be killed. She actually told the police that, as if it was a reasonable excuse for murder. And then, crazier, because Russia... The police do not initially arrest her. They first have to go back to court and talk things over with the judge. In Russia, still to this day, you can legally kill someone over certain specific insults. Like if someone wishes death on your mom or wife or children, you can kill them legally. Or if they insult your character, accuse you of being a liar, an adulterer, you can kill them. Also, if you can prove that someone you're living with is toxic, if you can get others to corroborate that, that they are toxic, you can kill them. One more thing, uh, that's not true. Did anyone believe the stuff I was just saying about how you can legally kill people in Russia for insults? Uh, Russia so crazy in so many ways, I thought maybe I could sneak that in there because it might sound legit. No, you can't, you can't kill people legally for insulting you in Russia. Uh, you can probably bribe certain officers into looking the other way when you do kill someone, but you can't just say they insult you and get away with murder. Samsonova also tells officers that another one of her neighbors, <laughs> a 67-year-old retired physician, also hated Ulanova. And that this physician persuaded Samsonova to kill Ulanova. And then she sweetened the deal by promising Samsonova 268,000 rubles for the contract kill. About $3,400. <laughs> so 
Samsonova tells police that on the night of July 23rd, she let this doctor into her apartment, and then Samsonova made a lethal injection into Ulanova's arm. Then she said they dismembered the body, carried the pieces out together, and the police actually do look into this crazy story. Uh, thanks to some closed-circuit security camera footage, they are able to determine that the doctor had no part in this crime. This poor doctor. More, more on her later on. Studying that footage, investigators determined that Samsonova left Ulanova's apartment seven times on the night of the murder. She was wearing a blue rain jacket. Each time, she was carrying a bulky item. One time, she's dragging what looks like a shower curtain. Uh, there's even footage of Samsonova carrying a white saucepan. Guess what's inside the saucepan? Uh, Ulanova's head. A head authorities never recovered. Samsonova clearly the murderer. Also clear that no one helped her carry out the horrific crime. Uh, despite being caught red-handed, Samsonova refuses to cooperate with investigators. She won't tell them where they can find the rest of the body. She does talk to them about all kinds of other weird outlandish shit because she's a lunatic. She makes up all kinds of wild stories, telling the police she used to be an actress. She wasn't. She tells them she graduated from the uh, Vaganovsky School, a prestigious ballet academy. She didn't. She said she had a strong artistic background, that she rubbed shoulders with some of the great artists of Russia. None of that shit's true. One, investi one investigator said regarding interrogating her, she's either much more stupid than she seems or much smarter. On July 28th, Samsonova detained on the suspicion of the murder and dismember dismemberment of her former roommate. Now all of her neighbors are questioned. Uh, a woman who'd been friends with Ul Ulanova for 43 years described what happened to her when she tried to check on Ulanova. First, she said she tried to call her friend. When she could never get a hold of her, she visited the apartment. She found Samsonova, asked where Valentina Ulanova was. Samsonova, not surprisingly, spun a wild tale, saying that she got up in the middle of the night, went to the kitchen for a cup of tea, saw Valentina lying on the floor. You didn't call an ambulance, the friend asked. I was afraid, Samsonova answered. And then the friend said, why didn't you contact us? We would have come running. The friend was especially worried by the fact that Samsonova asked her not to tell the police about the disappearance of Ulanova. The reason for this was that Samsonova really wanted to keep living in that apartment. She said she just liked that apartment. She just lamented, can't I live here? It feels so good here. So calm, so quiet. What a weird obsession she had with this apartment that was essentially identical to her own apartment. Investigators then search Samsonova's actual apartment, the one she's supposed to be living in. They find traces of dry blood under the skirting board, uh, skirting board in the kitchen. They find her diary where she allegedly wrote about committing at least 11 murders, maybe 13. They find a book of esoteric astrological information with some pages torn out, sitting in an old cabinet. They find documents belonging to Samsonova's missing husband, including a passport and a savings book. Super weird for him to leave without those unless he'd been murdered. Samsonova has yet to confess to killing that poor, skinny, toothless, ragbag, toting ginger. He took off, left his passport and his bank account information behind. Nah, who does that? Nobody. Uh, on July 29th, Samsonova is brought to the Frunze District Court of St. Petersburg, initially charged with only one murder. She then quickly admits to two more. The media outlet Fontanka reports that Samsonova admitted to killing Vodoya, her tenant, in November of 2000. She said she poisoned him, cut him into pieces in the bathroom with a knife, put him in packages, and scattered him across the Franzensky district. She also admitted to the 2003 murder of Sergei from Norilsk. But because investigators can't find their bodies, despite these confessions, she's not charged with their murders. In court, Samsonova seems more concerned about the journalist's uh, you know, uh, portrayal of her than the charges themselves. She's worried that her neighbors in St. Petersburg are going to read about her crimes. After being remanded in custody, she tells journalists, I knew you'd come. It's such a disgrace for me. All city will know. And then because she's so crazy, she sends a kiss to the cameras. Uh, let's talk a little about her diary now. Uh, we searched high and low all over Russian websites to see if we could find a transcript of this diary that's referenced so much in this timeline. It does not seem like the diary has ever been released in full to the public. In one article we found, detectives said they won't release the diary until all of the multiple murder investigations associated with her confessions and diary entries and other killings thought to be possibly attributed to her are completed. Many of these murder investigations are still supposedly ongoing. Uh, bits and pieces of the diary have surfaced, though, along with some general descriptions of what she wrote about. We learned that being able to speak and write in multiple languages, Samsonova would alternate between Russian, German, and English in her diary. She preferred to write in German. She wrote in this way so that, in her words, no one would understand. Apparently, in between entries about killing, Samsonova wrote extensively about just, you know, various mundane details of her everyday existence. She wrote about how she uh, slept badly or drank coffee or took medicine or did not eat. Uh, she wrote about how her typical daily schedule included being in bed by 9 p.m., being up at 3 a.m., Sounds like a absolutely terrible schedule. Who wants breakfast? 
It's three in the morning, Samsonova. Rise and shine! Early bird gets the poison worm! Uh, she wrote in her diary about researching the effects of various prescription drugs. She apparently would pick up drugs for her neighbors from time to time, stash a little bit away. <laughs> she also wrote, because why not, poems and songs. Couldn't find any of the poems and songs despite trying so fucking hard. Uh, but the idea that she was murdering folks and possibly writing little ditties about it, oh my God, just got my imagination going. I uh, wish I could find something. Even though I didn't find anything, I did do my best to interpret uh, and just try to write what I think one of her songs may have sounded like. I found a little music to accompany it. Uh, let's see how this works out. I know like when roommate nag me to make this just clean That good way to get head eight Do not make this witch get mean Sometimes I miss ginger son Selling vodka from our home Toothless moron pretty fun But then he go for Rome I kill him I kill my ginger husband son I kill him I kill my toothless husband, son. This old witch hag make him take dirt nap with his precious rag bag. I kill him. I don't, I don't know. Something like that. And if you're thinking, wait, that doesn't sound like a very good song. Listen, she wasn't fucking dropping hits, okay? I was, I was trying to be accurate. Anyway, that was fun for me. I hope it was fun for you. Uh, thanks to all these unusual details, investigators were especially intrigued by this atypical case. Uh, the head of the Violent Crimes Department of the Main Directorate of the Ministry of Internal Affairs volunteered to spend time with Samsonova. He started doing research into the occult so he could hopefully understand all the crazy shit she was talking about. He studied up on esoteric and astrological literature. He was quoted in the Russian press as saying, I sat down with Babushka on the same wavelength. Okay. He got so into all this that his colleagues started to worry he was spending too much time with her and too much time researching occult beliefs. Do not fall under one of her witch spells. Like they were legitimately worried that she was, you know, getting into his head. Uh, through his conversations with her, he would uh, uh, get her to verbally admit to a total of 11 killings, but only in general terms. Uh, the public, especially in St. Petersburg, became obsessed with her case. The legend of Babushka Yaga is born. The way she killed was so witch-like, you know, with the poisonings, uh, cooking up the body parts. Pages from a book of spells found on one of her victims' remains. She looked like some old drawings of Baba Yaga. A journalist wrote sensational stories. Not entirely supported by facts about her dark deeds. They wrote articles about her being a witch, about her sacrificing victims in occult rituals to stoke public interest in her story, to sell more papers, you know, get more website clicks. As, uh, as they do, on July 30th, 2015, 68-year-old Sam Sonova is officially charged for the killing of her former friend. Initially, just charged with this one crime. Uh, investigators emphasize that a month is going to be allotted for her psychiatric examination. The investigative committee also notes that there was currently no information about other crimes that the woman could have committed despite wide reporting to the contrary. Interesting. Uh, a lot of uh, back and forth details uh, from investigators about like, yes, she's suspecting a lot of murders. No, it's just the one is all over the place. The prosecution pointed out that uh, after the murder, Samsonova attempted to hide the evidence, meaning she knew what she had done, uh, knew that it was wrong, therefore not criminally insane. Uh, they said she was a flight risk because she didn't have any permanent social ties in St. Petersburg, as in she didn't have family there. Uh, the Granny Ripper's lawyer argued that her client did not intend to hide from the investigation. They argued that she had lived in St. Petersburg for many years. It's where everyone she had a social relationship of any kind also lived. Where would she go? They argued that she was clearly insane, should be given treatment, and not charged with a crime that would put her in a prison cell. The judge spoke to Sam Snova directly about her fate, asking her, I am asked to arrest you. What do you think? And Samsonova replied, you decide your honor. After all, I am guilty and I deserve a punishment. Then when Samsonova heard the judge order her arrest, she literally began smiling and clapping her hands. She said it had been hard to live with her past that she felt relieved to have finally been caught. At this point, she said after thinking about, about it a lot, she wanted to spend the rest of her life in prison. But did she mean all of this? Directly after these statements, she said a whole bunch of crazy shit. Trying to explain why she killed, she told the court that she had been tormented for many years by a maniac neighbor who lived in an apartment on the floor above her. She said, I thought about this murder 77 times. I want to go to jail. <laughs> I killed because the neighbor tortured me for a long time. Then she said of this upstairs neighbor, she raped me. She is a doctor. This is the doctor stuff I was talking about earlier. She watered my hair. 
She gave me bruises and cuts and broke my knees. There are thousands of witnesses to this. This was her great joy and type of sweetness. It's like a maniac Chikatilo. They feel pleasure from it. This is superhuman dexterity and bestial instinct. No one can repeat what she is doing. I don't know how much of that is just the translation and how much of that is just what she actually said. While being escorted away from the court, she apparently kept babbling about this neighbor, at one point shouting something uh, like, it's all a maniac. <laughs> Didn't take long to determine this alleged maniac. The doctor she'd accused of helping her with the murder of her roommate earlier uh, was not even in St. Petersburg at the time of the you know murder she was charged with. Samsonova then later admitted that she made all, made all that up about the doctor. Uh, why? Because she hated her. She said she gave this testimony out of personal hostility. How ha happy must uh, that retired doctor have been to, to know that that murderous nut was now behind bars? Uh, the media, after her official arrest, now began to speculate that she uh, must have been killing for 15 years, starting with her mysteriously absent husband way back in 2000. They reported that, and I have no idea where they got this information that Sab Sam Snow had put her husband to sleep with a large dose of sleeping pills. They said that she then cut his body into pieces, took it outside, buried it in the yard. They even stated that the remains had already been dug up and sent to the morgue, but that was not true. The State Investigative Directorate of the Investigative Committee of the Russian Federation in St. Petersburg. <sighs> These fucking titles in Russia kill me. Just the, just the most drab, soulless shit. Uh, where do you work? The State Investigative Directorate of the Investigative Committee of the Russian Federation in St. Petersburg. Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the spokesman for this committee, a guy named Sergei Kapitanov, informed the press that this information was false. He said, the investigative committee denies this information. There are no dug-up remains sent for examination. Tomorrow, Samsonova has only been charged with committing one crime. Uh, shortly after her arrest, speaking to how popular this case was, Sam Snova goes viral on the Russian equivalent of Facebook, uh, a very popular website I didn't know about before this suck, vk.com. Someone created a profile on her behalf. They uploaded photos of Sam Snova, pictures from her trial. More fake profiles soon sprung up, then more. Most of them clearly created as jokes. One profile had Sam Snova requesting donations to, quote, support domestic granny maniacs. <laughs> Became popular for a little while uh, for VK users to change their profile pics to photos of Samsonova. I feel like whoever was doing that would, would probably love this podcast. Uh, on the morning of August 5th, Samsonova was taken out of her cell, brought to her old place on Dimitrov Street for an investigative experiment that would end up adding to her infamy. Law enforcement officers wanted Samsonova to show them how she killed her victim, where she laid her remains, so she did with gusto. Really got into it. Police brought in a dummy, uh, and on it she demonstrated with, with a bunch of zeal and a big crazy smile on her face, how she dismembered Ulanova. She described how she couldn't get through the hip bones, how they were too heavy for her to carry far, so she dumped them in her neighbor's backyard. <laughs> also explained how she disposed of the trash bags throughout the neighborhood. Still wouldn't reveal where Ulanova's head was, though. I don't know uh, why. Maybe she uh, didn't, didn't want them to find bite marks on it, or maybe she thought if they found her head, it would uh, diminish her witch powers or something. On August 31st, 2015, Samsonova transferred to a special psychiatric clinic to be examined further. The press speculated that if doctors deemed her insane, the charges would be dropped and Sam Snova could undergo psychiatric treatment and possibly be released. Now, can you imagine if they did release her? Imagine if you're that retired doctor living on that floor above her. The one she said all kinds of crazy shit about. The one she talked about wanting to kill 77 times. Now she shows back up again. Gets her old place back. Comes knocking on your door. Hello, Dr. Maniac. Did you miss me? I'd not forgotten insults. I'd not forgotten 77 thoughts of murder. Not forgotten many broken knees, witnessed by thousands. Not forgotten the rapes or how you watered my hair. Also, do you have a little bit of vinegar I can borrow? Just two or three tablespoon tops. I'm making borscht and I not <laughs> realize I'm almost out. Uh, meanwhile, she's being evaluated. Police unearth new evidence of another murder. Uh, with the working knowledge of Sam Snow's MO in mind, with her diary, authorities recall that 12 years earlier, in about the exact same spot that her neighbor's remains were found, Another mutilated, headless, armless body was discovered. It was a tattooed man, Sergei, Samsonova's former tenant. While Samsonova never admitted to this crime, she did write about the man's tattoos in her journal, and upon searching her house, police found his business card. They also found another strange, more solid link between the two. Right? We mentioned that she had that book of black magic, uh, found next to her diary. Sometimes it's listed as book of black magic. Sometimes it's listed as book spells, sometimes astrological stuff. Well, this book had dried blood on it, pages torn out, missing pages. Uh, you know, had been found on the corpse, you know, 12 years earlier. Uh, fairly incriminating. On September 8th, an article from Russia's Life News reports on the con contents of Samsonova's diary. 
The article says that while other media coverage has claimed that the diary described 13 murders they found in their own investigation, the truth was much more confusing. The diary, which the report had been kept inside a cookbook for several years, was indeed in German, but according to their findings, the author of the notes does not know the language of uh, Goethe. The vocabulary is poor. Mistakes are found in every phrase. They printed examples like the following passage. I slept very little today. Bad mood. It's all very bad. I drank coffee again. In addition to household items, Sam Sonova carefully recorded names, phone numbers, addresses, useful contacts. She wrote down all her expenses to the penny. Excuse me. Collected tongue twisters, beauty recipes, even conspiracies. I wish I knew what conspiracy she was into. I wonder if she was a hollow earther. I feel like there's a good chance. Probably believed in the supposed uh, Atlantean sorcerer battles Madame Blavatsky used to write about. Among the notes uh, in her diary, there were several essays similar to prayers, spells, quotes from the work of famous poets. In one passage, she wrote, I leave the door, stand in the middle of the yard. Nicola the Pleasant is standing with me. Close the house with a bolt lock. Who goes? Will pass. Who goes? Will pass. The burglar enters the yard. He won't get there. His legs will grow stiff. His eyes will darken. Amen. Believing in the best, you increase its likelihood. Books don't really teach anything new. Books just help you see what's already inside you. This is enlightenment. Okay, you know, so she's, you know, struggling mentally. Uh, also around this time, one of the people Samsonova claimed to have killed in her diary, another one of her tenants, discovered alive and well by investigators. So this, of course, is confusing. Throws some doubt into the validity of some of her other confessions. The media was now saying she killed dozens or hundreds of people, but did she or did most of the murders only happen in her mind? So strange. She clearly did kill a man she did not write about in her diary, the tattoo guy. She almost certainly killed her husband, who she also did not confess to killing, but then she did not kill someone she did write about killing. So much mystery around uh, the case of Babushka Yaga. On November 25th or 26th, 2015, according to different sources, the Frusensky District Court decides to extend Samsonova's psychiatric examination for another month. After more testing, it's determined that she is a danger to society and herself. Yeah, you think? Uh, she's transferred from the psychiatric clinic to another specialized incarceration facility where she's ordered to remain until the end of the investigation. Unfortunately, the results of her psychological examination are kept secret. Samsonova's defense appeals the decision to put her in a specialized institution, citing her age. They ask to have her placed back in her apartment, but the court rules that Samsonova is a flight risk and, you know, uh, is dangerous to the people living in the apartments nearby if she gets put back there. Yeah, you know, she'd probably kill a, a neighbor or three. Uh, she'd for sure kill Dr. Maniac. On December 9th, 2015, Samsonova was sent to a specialized hospital in Kazan, about 1,000 miles from St. Petersburg. One source says she'll be constantly monitored by doctors. On August 20th, 2016, the court finally finds Samsonova guilty of the murder of Valentina Ulanova. The official verdict is that she killed one person for sure. Not clear uh, how long she was sentenced to remain behind bars. She was then placed in a psychiatric, excuse me, psychiatric treatment facility. Uh, on August 22nd, uh, just a few days later, 2016, the court reveals that additional murders Samsonova may have committed are still being investigated. Then on November 8th, it's discovered that Sam Snova has been uh, calling a psychological helpline on a regular basis over the past 12 years. She apparently uh, usually discussed everyday issues, including which other tenants were riling her up. She consistently felt paranoid, persecuted, but for some reason, she was never prescribed treatment. Uh, considering Russia's long history with various secret police agencies that really did spy on citizens, uh, probably fairly common to feel paranoid. Then on March 17th, 2017, a court source says that Sam Snova has now uh, had the guilty the decision reversed says she's now been found not guilty after an appeal by reason of insanity uh, this is based on the determination that she indeed suffers from paranoid schizophrenia she'll continue to be institutionalized given treatment none of the articles we could find made it clear if she may be released someday because of the not guilty decision uh, while they don't say it directly i interpret the reporting of her sentencing as allowing for the possibility that she could in fact be released which is terrifying Yes, she's old, but, you know, clearly you don't need to be young to do the uh, type of murdering that Granny Ripper was doing. Uh, Russian psychiatrist and criminalist Mikhail Vinokradov described Samsonova's mental health this way. He said, firstly, she has been ill for a long time. Of course, she has schizophrenia. I am not ready to say what form it is very difficult to determine. The fact is that any schizophrenia implies two sides of the personality. Some patients openly attack people, others hide. There are many talented people among mentally ill people, artists, poets, scientists. They show their pathology in different ways. They walk naked, etc. This lovely lady solved issues by means of murder. That's an actual quote. This lovely lady. Fucking what? Lovely lady? Did she kill up and cut up a roommate after refusing for a month to leave this woman's apartment? Yes, we know this. Did she boil woman head? 
refused to tell where head is. Of course, we know this. But she is still lovely lady at the end of the day. Some people solve issue by communicate. Some solve uh, by murder. She never learned proper conflict resolution skill. No one teach her. It's big misunderstanding. She gifts to Russia, really. Have you test her apartment vodka? It's fantastic. Uh, this the same criminologist would ask if it was possible that Sam Snow didn't realize the severity of her crimes. He answered, yes, it is quite possible. Considering that there is evidence of her passion for the occult, she could only consider herself to be a kind of instrument of retribution who fulfilled someone's will, including to save the world in this way, destroy evil, etc. So she didn't realize what she was doing, uh, you guys. She didn't realize it was wrong. She was just a witch doing some witch shit. She was trying to live that best, you know, witch life. Uh, a little over a year later, the 71-year-old Sam Snow was charged with yet another crime. July 26, 2018, the Department of Bailiffs in St. Petersburg opens a case against her. You're going to love this. For not paying a rent. Her debt amounted to 190 bucks or so. The missing rent was uh, from a, a time after she'd been arrested and sent to a psychiatric facility. <laughs> so somehow this made it to court. They're like, yeah, hey, she's not paying her apartment rent. Yeah, she's in fucking jail. Uh, she was found not liable since, you know, she was incarcerated. Uh, Russia, you fucking kill me. I so badly want to visit Russia now, m more than ever. I want to spend some time in that beautiful and insane country. Uh, finally, based on a few hard to totally understand Russian sources, it seems that there, uh, yeah, still are open investigations on anywhere from 10 to 14 additional murders she may have been involved in, and that will take us out of this week's Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. The Granny Ripper, Babushka Yaga, Psycho, a.k.a. Tamara Samsonova, apartment vodka distiller, jean and sweater slanger, real-life witch. Such a unique case. But not the only scary female serial killer out there. While over 90% uh, of serial killers are men, there's actually well over 20 other uh, uh, older women that could fall into the same category as Samsonova that we know of. Uh, we're going to preview some of the worst female serial killers out there that we haven't talked about on Time Suck before. Uh, some of them also killing like uh, Baba Yaga, or not Baba Yaga, Babushka Yaga in their senior years. Might have to suck some of these uh, ladies down the road. Uh, before I launch into the first summary, I do have one last sponsor break. Sorry about that. I know we don't always uh, have them at the end of the show. Uh, Time Suck is brought to you today by GrigoryGrabavoy.com's annual Anything You Want for $1,500 sale. Hello, I Grigory Grabavoy. 100th level Russian sorcerer. I make you offer of lifetime. You miss dead pets? I bring back $1,500. Maybe grandpa passed away before you're ready. I bring back $1,500. You have AIDS? Cancer? Herpes? One leg shorter than other? Too many mole on face? It's no problem. I fix $1,500. Maybe you want to take vacation to Lost City of Atlantis. I send you $1,500. I rush a most powerful sorcerer. Maybe witch making life hell for you with many curses. I blast away all witch curse, $1,500. Bigger penis, $1,500. Smaller vagina, $1,500. You know like being paralyzed to wheelchair? $1,500 I have you running to give me more money for more cool spells. Do not miss out on GrigoryGrabovoy.com's annual anything you want for $1,500 sale. With each purchase, I throw in free bottle of Babushka Yaga apartment vodka and two-hour rejuvenation session with sexy shrub slut. Do not delay. Make me, Grigory Grabovoy, your personal sorcerer today. I got to say, uh, out of all the deals we've offered, I think that might be the best one. It, so it sounds like you get a lot for $1,500. Uh, okay, now let's meet these uh, five other lady dirtbags. You ever heard of Juana Barraza? If you don't know that name, you might recognize her by her stage name, the Silent Lady. By day, Juana Barraza worked as a popcorn vendor and sometimes as a luchadora, a female wrestler, at a wrestling venue in Mexico City. Stocky and strong, Barraza uh, took to the ring. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop that tongue roll uh, attempt. Uh, Barraza took to the ring as a lady of silence as she competed on Mexico's semi-pro wrestling circuit. And while she was charged with 20, 27 murders, excuse me, between the years of 1998 and 2006, it's believed she killed between 42 and 48 women, almost all of them over the age of 60, by either strangling them or literally beating them to death. She would have been 41 when the killing started, so not Granny Ripper age, but she didn't start in her 20s or 30s either. She would get inside the homes of elderly women by pretending to help carrying groceries, 
or claiming to be sent by the government for medical help. Once inside, she would pick a weapon, like a set of stockings or a telephone cord, and strangle them or just straight up beat the fuck out of them. Police following the cases had their own theory on who the killer uh, was and what was driving him. According to criminologists, they strongly believe the killer was a man with a confused sexual identity who had been abused as a child by an elderly relative. The killings were his way of channeling his resentment towards innocent victims who stood in for the person who had abused him. Eyewitnesses or eyewitness descriptions of a possible suspect reinforced this idea. Let Barraza keep killing undetected. According to the witnesses, a suspect had the stocky build of a man but wore women's clothing. As a result, the city police began rounding up known transvestite prostitutes for questioning. A major breakthrough in the case finally occurred on January 25, 2006, when a suspect was arrested fleeing from the home of the serial killer's latest victim, Ana Maria de los Reyes Alfaro. And that suspect was Juana Barraza, then a 48-year-old woman. She would be sentenced to 759 years in prison for the 27 murders she was charged with. Should we suck her someday? Her story is so fucking crazy. Wrestler and popcorn vendor by day. Brutal murderer by night. Super fucked up. But also a great excuse to have a suck full of insane wrestling matches. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. The silent lady is ready to butter up some popcorn and bust some fucking heads. Something like that, you know? Uh, Barraza associated her elderly victims with her mother and believed that she was helping society by killing them. She was uh, really killing her mother over and over again, an alcoholic mother who she accused of pimping her out to men when she was just a little kid in exchange for beer. Uh, The next old lady would not kill random citizens. She would kill her husbands, uh, Melissa Ann Shepard, a.k.a. the Internet Black Widow, born in Burnt Church, New Brunswick in 1935. Millie moved to Ontario with her family when she was a teenager. And in 1955, she met and married a factory worker, Russell Shepard, and they had two kids. And between 1970 and 1985, Melissa was convicted on a string of charges of fraud, forgery, and impersonation in Toronto and in Georgetown, Prince Edward Island. It wasn't until she turned 55 that she began committing her most serious and violent crimes. In 1992, Shepard was convicted of manslaughter over the murder of her 44-year-old second husband, Gordon Stewart. Ran him over twice with a car. He had tranquilizers in his system at the time. She told police he had raped her and that she ran over him while trying to escape. And this is, in all likelihood, bullshit. Uh, Trying to escape from man passed out on tranquilizers seems fishy. She was sentenced to six years in prison, released early on good behavior, serving just two years. Fucking two years for running over a dude on purpose and killing him. Uh, Never any proof. That he did rape her, by the way. Just the word of a murderer. Just the word of someone who had been convicted numerous times on fraud, forgery, and impersonation charges over the years. A known liar. A convicted liar. Awesome. Good job, court system. And then she'd kill again. Following her release, she toured the country. She had to have fucking balls to give speeches on battered woman syndrome and killing in self-defense. She's so full of shit. In 2000, Shepard married her third husband, American Robert Frederick, uh, shortly after meeting him online through a Christian dating site. Fuck yeah, she's Christian now. She seems like, you know, probably one of Jesus' favorites. Uh, Her new husband died 14 months later, leaving her, and that was a a slam on her. Not on Christianity, by the way, if I didn't make that clear. Uh, Her new husband died 14 months later, leaving her with tens of thousands of dollars in assets. She was never charged with the crime related to his death, but this guy's sons later won back uh, 15 grand, and they do think she killed their dad. I think she did too. Uh, Then in 2005, she settled in with another man she'd met online in Florida. And right away, what do you know it? He started getting sick a lot. Weird. The man's son alerted police after his father was hospitalized half a dozen times uh, that he noticed unusual activity in his father's bank account. Hospital tests showed the man tested positive for tranquilizers. Uh, But police could not prove that she poisoned him. They did charge Shepard with grand theft forgery and using a forged document to which she pled guilty. She was sentenced to five more years in prison. Then in 2012, two years after getting back out of jail, the now 77-year-old woman is charged with the attempted murder of her fourth husband, Fred Weeks. She can't fucking help herself. She's just addicted to doing horrible shit. After pleading guilty to lesser charges, she's sentenced to three and a half years in prison. How does she get these tiny sentences all the time? And, and, and incredibly, she is currently living free. Uh, she got arrested yet again for using the internet on a computer in a Halifax library in 2016. Under the conditions of her parole, she's supposed to never get on the internet and try and find more dudes to kill, which makes sense. Uh, the 85-year-old now has a legal obligation to report any and all personal relationships to authorities. And she could be killing some poor Canadian grandpa or great-grandpa right now. 
I just picture her, her using like a walker to shuffle down the hallway of a nursery home. She has some poison stuffed in a pocket, waiting to sprinkle it into some poor octogenarian's pudding. Just some evil, murderous female version of Mr. Burns from The Simpsons. Just, yes, me this. Excellent. Who shall get Mama's spicy pudding today? Uh, this next senior killer earned the gruesome nickname the Death House Landlady. Dorothea Puente was put on trial at the age of 64 when cops found evidence she'd killed nine people between 1982 and 1988. Her murders began when she was 53 years old. She ran an unlicensed boarding house, tended to rent to people who didn't have many social connections, people who lived high-risk lifestyles, people she thought wouldn't be missed if they, got, if they disappeared. Police found nine bodies buried beneath her house. Some were in an almost mummified state, wrapped tight with cloths, bed sheets, duct tape, one missing its head, hands, and feet. Police accused Puente of lacing food or drink. She served her victims with uh, a lethal mix of prescription drugs, poisoned them to collect their social security checks, a scheme that netted her more than $5,000 a month. In 1993, after what was then the longest del deliberation in a murder case in California history, 24 days, the jury convicted her of three of the killings. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She'll, she would die in prison in 2011 at the age of 82. Not surprisingly, she also had a fucked up childhood. Her mom was a prostitute. Her dad was a drunk. Uh, he died when she was eight and her mom died the following year. She was then sent to a boarding school where she was sexually abused. Uh, her former boarding house, located at 1426 F Street in Sacramento, now rumored to be super haunted, has been featured on an episode of Ghost Adventures. Man, the haunting is, uh, can be real. And it, as those of you who listen to Scared to Death know I'm definitely open, a skeptic, but open to that possibility. There's going to be some fucking creepy spirits in that house. Uh, next on this list, a geriatric killer duo. This is maybe the weirdest to me. Not the most gory or grotesque, but just an odd partnership here. 2008, Helen Golay, a 78-year-old living in Santa Monica, California, and Olga uh, Rutterschmidt, 75-year-old living in Hollywood, showbiz, uh, were convicted of the murders of two vagrants. They were both sentenced to consecutive life sentences or life terms. Their killings would become known as the Black Widow Murders. On two separate occasions, they took a homeless man, first Paul Vados, then Kenneth McDavid, took them under their wings, housed them, fed these guys, looked after them for uh, two years each, then killed these guys with their cars, hit and run style. They took out millions and millions of dollars in dozens of separate life insurance policies on each dude. After Vado's death, Goulet and Rutter Schmidt received benefits from eight different life insurance policies that have been taken out on him. After McDavid's death, Goulet received a total of one and a half million dollars in insurance proceeds. Rutter Schmidt, a total of uh, just under $700,000. And then the two women botched a third attempt. They're still trying to do that. They don't need the fucking money. They're very old. They could just enjoy being, I don't know, old evil ladies, but they, clearly they like to kill. Uh, the would-be victim, Jimmy Covington, was asked to apply for an $800,000 life insurance policy. The women were dogging him about it, aggressively insisting he'd do it. He started to worry. They wanted to kill him for the money. He fled, told police. The two women were brought in, and they folded under questioning, and the gig was up. Now 89 and 87, respectively, they're both still alive, serving their sentences in uh, Central California's women's facility in uh, Chow Chowchilla. One more. This next lady killed upwards of 30 people in the 1800s. Jane Toppin was a classic angel of death, the nickname given to nurses and doctors who purposely killed her patients. She was born Honora Kelly around 1857 in Boston, the youngest of four girls in a poor Irish immigrant family. Her mother died of tuberculosis when she was a year old. Her father, Peter Kelly, a tailor, lost his mind, was severely mentally ill, earned the nickname of Kelly the Crack as in Kelly the Crackpot. He uh, was so mentally ill, he apparently sewed his fucking eyelids shut. At one point. Yeah. When your dad does that, that's probably going to fuck a kid up a little bit. F father, father, are, are you all right? Yes, Jane. I am almost free. Sometimes you must go blind to truly see the darkness. I can feel it. I can taste it, my dear. The darkness is pure. Come near. Let me sew you shut so we can see together. You know, just you know, something like that. I picture him doing it. Uh, 1863, Kelly, in a brief moment of sanity, took six-year-old Honora her eight-year-old sister, Delia, her sister, Nellie, age not given to an orphanage called the Boston Female Asylum in the city's South End. Sounds like a super warm and fun and cozy place. Uh, Delia would soon go into prostitution. Nellie would end up in an insane asylum. So I'm guessing it probably wasn't the best place to grow up. The orphanage placed girls in respectable families when they turned 10. And by placed, I mean sold them into a form of child slavery. 
Honora became an indentured servant to Mrs. Ann C. Toppin of Lowell, Massachusetts, spent the rest of her childhood doing whatever the fuck Ann told her to do. At the age of 33, Jane trained or started her training as a nurse at Cambridge Hospital in 1887. There, she earned her nickname Jolly Jane. She had a friendly, outgoing personality, but that persona was just an act. Uh, the hospital administration grew concerned over her obsession with autopsies. They had no idea she'd begun to experiment with morphine and atropine on elderly patients. Jane soon took a new job at Massachusetts General Hospital, lost that one when she recklessly gave out opiates. Nevertheless, doctors still continued to recommend her as a private nurse, uh, especially for their wealthy clients. She was still a patient favorite, came across as nothing but warm and friendly. Then in 1901, when she was 44, the family of one of her victims grew suspicious. Police assigned a detail to follow her. Soon she was arrested for murder, and then she confessed to the murder of 31 people. She was quoted as saying that she aspired to have killed more people, helpless people, than any other man or woman who has ever lived. So she was just a, a, a little bit fucked up. Then she told investigators that the killings gave her a sexual thrill. She said that after poisoning her victims, she would climb into bed with them, fondle them, attempt to, quote, see the inner workings of their souls through their eyes. Dear God, that's creepy, as they died. In their final moments, she would hold them close and stare into their eyes. Uh, it appears that she may have inherited some of her dad's mental instability. And she would spend the last 40 years of her life committed to an insane asylum. So as you can see, while the Granny Ripper's tale is rare, is unique, she's far from the only female killer, serial killer we could have chosen uh, to cover. And she's not the only geriatric female killer we could have chosen to cover today. Many other female murderers, uh, also than the five additional killers that I just previewed. Um, so, you know, for future topics, uh, you know, if you guys want to send in to the Bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com or for you spaces, vote some of these up, show some interest. We can do more female true crime sucks. Uh, Babushka Yaga, let's wrap up with that now. Was she was she a witch casting spells and practicing strange rituals? Was she a, a cannibal like the Baba Yaga of the old stories? Or was she just a confused schizophrenic who wanted a better apartment? Someone who, uh, you know, just saw human lives as disposable. Was she a little bit of all of that? I don't know. Let's take four looks back and one look into additional info in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Russia is obsessed with witchcraft and the occult. They have more faith healers than actual doctors. Grigory Grabovoy, charging 1500 bucks to bring kids back from the dead. Dude claims to have cured AIDS and found Atlantis. And Antoli Karashovsky, healing people, watching him on TV through his magical telepathic energy waves. These are the type of people desperate Russians were turning to in the late 80s and 90s. Number two, Tamara Samsonova, the granny ripper, not an actual granny. She had no children, let alone grandchildren. The word babushka, which was added to Yaga for another one of her nicknames, means older woman or a grandma. Number three, apartment vodka. When Sam Snow wasn't killing, she was selling jeans or sweaters or vodka out of her apartment or maybe working as a, as a blacksmith. Thank you, Russia, for story details like those. Number four, VK.com. I'd never heard of this Russian Facebook site before, but it's one of the most popular websites in the world. It has over 500 million users, is the most popular website in all of Russia, one of the top 20 most visited websites on earth, and Sam Snow went viral on it in 2015. The Granny Ripper's face became a popular profile pick choice and numerous fake accounts sprung up, and I love that. It's almost like in the face of something deeply horrific and disgusting, Russians, just like many of us in other countries around the world, find that comedy is a good way to cope. Number five, something new. The Granny Ripper isn't the only Russian murderer to have had a Chikatilo obsession. At least four other mass killers in Russia have admitted to admiring Chikatilo. There were the chessboard killer, Alexander Pashushkin, who set out to beat Chikatilo and kill one person for every square on the chessboard, jailed for life in 2007, uh, convicted of killing 49 people, mainly in Bitsa Park or around Bitsa Park in Moscow, suspected of killing around 60. We covered the chessboard killer back in October of 2018. Uh, Siberian slaughterer Mikhail Popkov, former cop who became known as the werewolf, believed to have killed over 80 people, according to Olga Muscovia, senior prosecutor at the Ursk, Irkutsk region of Siberia. Uh, Popkov compared himself to Chikatilo as well. Uh, we covered the werewolf back in April last year. And there are two Russian killers we didn't cover. Penza cannibal Alexander Bushkov even replicated Chikatilo's methods, maniacally stabbing his victims in the same way as his idol. His other idol was Hitler. Dude was not good at picking idols. He was nabbed after killing 11 people by the age of 23. His mother said later, I saw him cutting out stories about Chikatilo from the newspapers and putting them in his scrapbook. Ugh. 
Caught in 2012, sentenced to life in prison. Lastly, ex-detective Sergei the Beast Tkach, convicted by a Ukrainian court in 2008 of 29 murders and 11 attempted murders. Uh, he killed for 25 years from 1980 to 2005. The Russian-born monster claims to have killed roughly 200 people, saying his motive was revenge on women and, quote, simple sexual pleasure. He boasted, I'm not a man, I'm a beast. Same as Chikatilo. So if we decide to head back to Russia for more true crime, uh, clearly plenty of dirt bags to choose from. Time suck. Top five takeaways. The Granny Ripper has been sucked. Uh, what an interesting world we live in. Sam Snova's murders, uh, to me, were the least part, interesting part of uh, that, this episode. Man, sorcerers. People hiring sorcerers in Russia now to protect themselves from witches in 2020. Gosh dang. Uh, I know we didn't have all the details we normally have for a true crime episode, but just the backdrop and just the the overall <laughs> broad strokes of the story made it worth it to me as far as an entertaining episode. I hope you agree. Uh, thank you to the Bad Magic Productions team for, for all the help in making time suck. Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, the script keeper, Zach Flannery, Sophie, the fact sorceress, Evans, Bit Elixir, Logan and Kate Keith, the art warlock and Bad Magic Baroness running badmagicmerch.com and our socials. Thanks to all those who've uh, joined the Cult of the Curious private Facebook group. Roughly 23,000 members in there to share some humor and community with, to talk about interesting, oftentimes dark shit with. Uh, huge thanks, as always, to Liz Hernandez and her all-seeing eyes running the Cult of the Curious Facebook page. Uh, thanks to all the uh, roughly 8,000 wonderful weirdos having fun on Discord. All sorts of mayhem to get involved with over there. And thanks to the space that are playing the Time Suck trivia on the app, C.S. Gallagher leading round four with 3,344 points. A couple weeks left to go to see who uh, brings the next Cowboy Pigeon Trophy home. Next week on Time Suck, we cover yet another cult. 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 Uh, this will be a cult unlike the cults we've covered before, the Nexium Sex Cult. Spelled N-X-I-V-M, but pronounced Nexium. Yep, like the brand name of the drug that treats acid reflux. Uh, Nexium, a cult that operated at Albany, New York, beginning in the mid-90s, lasting until its founder, Keith Rainier, arrested just a few years ago in 2017, following former members going public with stories about how they'd been forced to spend all their money on Nexium classes, forced to participate in strange rituals, and even sometimes literally branded. This is a modern as fuck cult, sometime, uh, somewhere between a multi-level marketing scheme, diet Scientology, and a true sex cult. Nexium counted thousands of members at its peak enrollment, including wealthy heiresses, famous actors, and the children of diplomats and state officials. Keith Rainier had a firm grasp on these people. They believed he was a kind of god. They called him Vanguard, as in the leader of a movement. They thought they were part of something truly special, but they weren't. They were part of something disgusting, manipulative, and criminal. 60-year-old Keith, convicted of sex trafficking and other crimes, scheduled to be sentenced in just a few weeks. He's expected to get somewhere between 15 years and life in prison. When we explore his cult this next week, we're also going to dig into just how fucked up and toxic certain multi-level marketing companies can be, even when they're not weird sex cults. The main takeaway is going to be if someone promises you that they can solve your life in a matter of a few months, they probably can't. If it sounds too good to be true, it generally truly really is too good to be true. How did Keith Rainier transition from the head of a pyramid scheme to becoming a cult leader? Find out next week on another strange and entertaining edition of Time Suck. And now let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Starting off with a couple of uh, Hollow Earth updates. B. Arthur, top shelf sack, not the deceased former Golden Girls cast member, writes, Well, Master Sucker, you asked, so here I am. My father is, was, not sure, a Hollow Earth believer who believed that we were visited by UFOs from both inside and outside of Earth. How does the sun set? Well, let me tell you. A shade is cast over it every night. My dumb kid brain once asked, like magic? And he said, no, stupid. <laughs> it's technology. There's no such thing as magic. The tunnels to get inside used to be visible and accessible, but our wars are scary. So they have been concealed and will maybe be open again when the surface is like Star Trek. He was also a diagnosed schizophrenic, but I'm sure that's unrelated. So there you go. B. Goddamn Arthur, my real name. <laughs> B, uh, sorry that your dad suffers from schizophrenia. Uh, holy shit, this message made me laugh. My favorite part is him telling you that you're stupid for thinking that the hollow earth sets based on magic. It's technology. Come on, wake up. And yeah, I think him believing all that and being schizophrenic, uh, probably related. 
Uh, sincerely hope he's getting treatment. Hope that it's helping. And I love your name. Golden Girls, legit one of the best, funniest sitcoms ever produced. The jokes per minute on that show, off the charts. The writing's so crisp, so tight. Not joking. I feel like people are going to think I'm joking. Sitcom writers will study Golden Girls. It was that damn good. They still study it today. Uh, go back and watch an episode if you think I'm bullshitting. Fantastic. It holds up. Fantastic show. More Hollow Earth fuckery coming in now from Space Edward Smalls. Leaving his real name out. This message, both funny and, uh, well, kind of depressing. Uh, Small writes, holy shit, wackadoodles truly do walk among us. I work in a plant breeding lab. I work in a plant breeding lab, excuse me, at a well-known university under a well-respected genetics professor with three PhDs. This lady knows her stuff, or so I thought. Today, a group of us were doing field work, and we got to talking about our favorite podcasts. Of course, I brought up Time Suck. Thank you. And some of what you cover and some of the shit stains and events that you have sucked. When I said you occasionally cover some different topics, such as this past week's Hollow Earth episode, the professor lit up. Before I could mention anything else about the show, she immediately went on about how we live on the crust of the earth, but the inside is filled with aliens that control our society's leaders. I was dumbfounded. This professor, who is extremely well-respected in her field, who has never shown any signs of wackadoodleness, taught me countless things about genetics and wrote me a letter of recommendation for my career search, believes we live on a hollow rock filled with aliens who control our society. She continued to say she once visited them after traveling through a lava tube that her husband, a geologist, discovered while they were backpacking across Europe and Africa. This is extra shocking as not only does a well-educated professor think she met aliens in the center of the earth, her husband, who is a geology professor, believes the world is hollow and filled with aliens. Maybe worth noting that he is that he retired after he had a severe head injury in a climbing accident years <laughs> that is worth noting years ago. Most everyone in the field that day tried to tell her as respect as respectfully as possible that she is nuts and needs to have her head checked. Truly goes to show you may never you it truly goes to show you really never know who is a purebred grade A through and through wackadoodle. Keep on sucking. Not a space lizard, but a hollow earth hell lizard. Smalls. Uh, Smalls, that is very fucking disturbing. Uh, the geology professor with a severe head wound, uh, believe in it. Well, that part makes sense to me. Guessing he legitimately has brain damage. But your professor, like, how? People as educated as she is claiming this shit is true does such a tremendous disservice to society. Because then wackadoodles can point to her and be like, see? See, the multiple doctorate having genetics professor believes it, so it must be true. And what's up with her claim that she snuck down a fucking lava tube? Visited aliens? Did she forget cell phone uh, to bring her cell phone when she did that? Or to bring a camera if it was in the days before cell phones? Yeah, you know, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to see some pics. You would think if you were going to take the time to crawl down a lava tube to visit aliens in the center of the earth that you might, I don't know, bring a camera. Just maybe. <sighs> Terrifying. She's still teaching. All right. Uh, hey, Meat Sex, do you remember last week when my allergies acted up when I read uh, that last message from Super Sucker Grace uh, Abafi? Well, after receiving our donation, Grace messaged us back and she wrote, I'm at my desk in tears. The staff at Girls in the Know just called me and told me about the donation you just made. We are a small organization and your gift is monumental for us. I am grateful beyond words for your generosity. I've been a loyal time sucker for over a year now. This is one of the reasons why. You've built a community, a family, a group that I'm proud to be a part of. When people ask me why I want to be a social worker, they usually joke and say it's clearly not for the money and the right. I want to be someone I didn't have when I was younger. Through Girls in the Know, I'm able to do that. The donation you made will help so many young girls learn they are enough. Thank you. Well, thank you, Grace. That is crazy, by the way, that you were crying. Do you know that I've never cried once in my whole life? Sometimes, Listen, sometimes it seems like I show real emotion, but it's, it's allergies, mother. Uh, for real, though. We wouldn't have known about your uh, charity had you not written in. Feel good about that, Grace. Uh, now take all that youthful optimism. Take that big heart of yours. Go set the fucking world on fire, you beautiful bastard. Hail Nimrod. Now, after a sweet and positive message, let us turn to utter and complete darkness for an anonymous toy box killer update. This is fucking insane. If you recall from that highly disturbing episode, that walking porta potty of a human being, David Parker Ray, uh, did not sexually torture all of his victims alone. He had accomplices, his main accomplice being Cindy Hendy. Cindy helped David commit numerous murders and rapes in the 90s. And in exchange for testifying against David, she was not sent to prison for life. She was sent to prison in 2000 to serve 36 years. She just got paroled this past July after not even serving 20 years, just under 20 years. She, li she listened, apparently, to the episode about her. And we know that because her daughter-in-law, 
is a fan of the show, and her daughter-in-law wrote in about Cindy recently moving in with her. She wrote, Cindy Hendy is my mother-in-law. Fuck, it's fucking insane. Now, for starters, I have to say I learned a lot more about her by listening to the podcast, and holy sheep shit, freaky. Her son and only son is my husband. When all this came out, he said none of it surprised him. He does not trust her, seems to be super sensitive about, uh, oh, and she seems to be super sensitive about a lot of shit. She recently got her eyebrows tattooed, and I told her, in my opinion, that they're too dark. (laughs) Probably shouldn't have done that. She said nothing to me about it. Later, her son, Shane, my husband, told me not to comment on it again because it really pissed her off. She's easily fired up, said something once about having weapons hidden around the house. Fantastic, right? That is so scary. I've yet to find any. She keeps her room real dark. I won't go in there. She has the window blocked out so, quote, no one can see her inside. I want to like her, but she's hard to get along with. Everyone in the house has a hard time getting along with her. Cindy's daughter-in-law then asked us if we had any questions for Cindy. So uh, we, I asked, was Cindy a willing participant in the crimes? Uh, I wanted to ask this because she tried to act when she was first caught like David forced her to participate. Like she was coerced. Here's what her daughter-in-law said. Oh, absolutely. She was a willing participant. She's never said she was coerced into any of it. The only thing she said was that she had no part of the murders. She said she never watched anyone get murdered. She did say that David would point out at the lake uh, that was on his property and tell her that he'd sunk bodies out there and that he and he would vaguely point to parts of the lake where the bodies might be. Uh, Uh, Then she says, we also told her. uh, No. Yeah. And then, sorry, we told her uh, to be really careful around Cindy, uh, asked if she was afraid of Cindy doing something to her. And she wrote back. She's very sensitive. She's easily fired up, but I'm not in any way worried. LOL. She's all of 105 pounds. I literally have 60 pounds on her. My son or her her son, my husband says she still has a lot of her old traits and the untrustworthy attitude she'd always had. Yeah. Finally, we asked Cindy's daughter-in-law if Cindy seemed remorseful about her participation in sexual torture and rapes. And she wrote back, she does not seem remorseful. She literally shrugs it all off. It's like she'd rather not deal with it. She said that the victim who got away, Cynthia Vigil, wanted to write a book about it all and asked Cindy to sign a release for her to use her name. And then Cindy asked for a cut of the book sales in order for her to agree. She's a motherfucker, huh? Man, she is a motherfucker. My God, be careful. She's in your house. She's a dangerous, morally bankrupt human being. She's about as fucking evil as as they can be. And, And don't let the fact that she's 60 and 105 pounds lull you into a false sense of security uh, based on pictures, the granny ripper probably wasn't more than like a buck 10 and she killed just fine. So stay safe, anonymous time sucker. And man, if I were you, I would do everything you can to get that fucking lunatic out of your house. Now back to a hollow earth related message. Super sucker. Shannon Hamlin writes a subject line of, I was trying to make sense of it. <laughs> and then for a message, she writes, good afternoon, Lord Suckington. Greetings from Arizona. I hope all is well on your side of the world. 2020 may be a dumpster fire, chock full of fireworks and shit, but there can be bright spots still in it, and I hope you and your team are having a few. Yeah, I think so. I think we are. While listening to this week's suck on the Hollow Earth Theory, I couldn't stop laughing. It was a much-needed jump into some true, insane bullshit after the last few, well, the whole year, pretty much. I started laughing particularly hard when you said, I have the most ridiculous search history from this past week. I was just trying to get it to make sense, which is true. This is my life. The phrase, but I have questions, has permanently reserved space number two or number three in my lexicon. I was always the kid that got into trouble for following up every question my mom answered with, but why? Now that I have young nieces and nephews, I completely understand how a kid's face can instantly become punchable when these words are uttered. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you for the much needed last entertainment. Thank you and your team for the excellent work they do and all the long hours they put in. You're appreciated more than you know. Sincerely, Shannon. Well, thank you, Shannon. It's very nice. And sounds like you and me were the same kind of kid. Uh, my parents would tell me I couldn't ask any more questions uh, at different points, like for the rest of the day. They would, they would just stop me and be like, no, no more questions now until tomorrow. And I thought that was so cruel. And then my son Kyler was born and I started and he started to talk and I was like, okay, I get it. Now I get it. Uh, yeah, the more I learn, it seems like the more questions I have. It's such a big and crazy world. Such a challenge to try and make sense of it all, but so fun to try, right? And all the craziness, uh, you know, as maddening as it can be in times, I guess it does keep us curious folk entertained as well. And, and yeah, and again, we are finding bright spots for sure in the dumpster fire that is 2020 and hope you continue to find some as well. Now we have a herding meat sack who would like a shout out. Awesome sucker Pete Mills writes a subject line of, I just lost my brother. And then he writes, Hello to all of you beautiful time suckers and space scissors. Long story short, I turned my brother on to Dan Cummins when he released Crazy with the Capital F. We both fell in love with his comedy. 
Our family has the same sense of humor, and it felt like Dan was a long lost relative. It sounds like you have a uh, either well, I was gonna say horrible, but like awesome. You have a, you have a family that some people would consider terrible. I would consider awesome. Uh, over ten years later, my brother and I are at Comedy Works Denver for the recording of Live in Denver. My brother and I are both space lizards. My brother just passed away on September twenty third at the age of thirty seven. He was a great meat sack and taken too soon. If you give a shout out to Amanda Armstrong, that would be fantastic. Amanda is a fellow meat sack and also our cousin, Hail Nimrod, Pete Mills. Pete, uh, I'm so sorry, my man. Can't imagine how heavy your heart must be right now. Sounds like you and your brother shared a lot of memories together and that's beautiful. And, you know, through those memories, he uh, he will live on. And hello, Amanda Armstrong. Uh, be a good cousin. Be a better friend to Pete right now. He seems like, seems like the best dude. Uh, Hail Nimrod to your entire family and yeah hope uh ho hope the rest of the year does not bring you further tragedies and now uh let's end on some dark comedy to you know to lighten things up a little bit high as fuck sucker taylor ghost chose the wrong episode to listen to uh when he was real stoned taylor wrote hello dan bojangles personal good boy treats supplier cummins i've been a sucker since the green river killer suck have seen your stand-up shows in phoenix the past two years I've been slacking a little bit on the podcast, decided to catch up, and I listened to the Richard Chase suck. I was also really high when I thought this would be a good idea, and I was high throughout the entire episode. Uh, I soon came to greatly regret this decision. While listening to the episode, I became very imaginative and focused on the descriptions on his character movements and his demented facial patterns. I also started really imagining Little Dick tearing, opening, uh, tearing open those animals and seeing their fear and pain for a brief moment when they died. I was like this for the whole episode. I almost started literally puking when you were describing how much he mutilated the one victim's body and dissected her. I'm highly terrified. Would not change a thing. Three out of five stars, Taylor Goss. Uh, Taylor, you should have probably listened to the Disney suck. Should have probably jumped back in on the Disney suck. Focus on evil Roy Disney instead of torturing yourself with the vampire of Sacramento. Uh, your message really cracked me up because I can just picture how I would process that information if I was hearing it for the first time when I was fucking stoned out of my mind. Hope your brain is healed a little bit. Uh, hope all of you are, are doing as well as you can be in 2020. Hail Nimrod, everyone. Thank you for writing in. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. And that's all for this week, Meat Sacks. More bad, ma <laughs> can't even think of my own company. More bad <laughs> Magic Productions content coming your way the rest of the week. Uh, New Spooks was scared to death Tuesday night. Some escapist laughs on Wednesday with uh, Mr. Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley on Is We Dumb? Uh, please don't poison anyone. Cut up their body. Toss some of it across the street because you don't want to move out of an apartment you're not supposed to be living in the first place. And, uh, and keep on sucking. Still knocking people down with that microphone. God. Wonder in how many places this is happening in Russia right now. Just an auditorium, with techno music, and a, and, a, and a sorcerer with a microphone bopping people. Oh, this is fantastic. But now he's lining up a family and getting ready to domino those motherfuckers. And why is he doing that? Because Russia.